once again, it's time for the Machine Shed. I respect what you've done in the Combine world. But when you step in this ring, you're messing with... St- Aaron Fennel. And that's something you don't do. Yeah, you're on a different planet now. You got your eyes locked on the world's most combine sound son of a... Now, I can't help it that I'm custom made. I can't help it that I look good, smell good, Woo! can't dance all night long. I can't help it. The Nature Boy. Woo! Last year, Aaron Fiddle spent more money on spilt high guard and fields all over Box View County than you made. I'm talking about the cinch shirt wearing, sheep raising, kiss seal, woo! Combine dealing, diesel driving, hay cutting, son of a gun. And he's having a hard time keeping his ostrich boots on the ground. Woo! What's rule number one? What's rule number one? Party. No, not party. No, it's not party. Two Moving Iron Podcast, The Machine Shed. i got Aaron Fennel here with me. How you doing, Aaron? Good, my man. How are you? Doing all right, buddy. We uh, had a little adventure last week. We did. We went down the I-80 corridor to a little place called Grand Island, and we went to uh, what they know as the Husker Harvest Days. It's such a big island, you can't even see any water around. You can't. You can't. It's like 1,500 miles in each direction before you hit any water. It's amazing. Uh, and we were there two days. That's my days. That's my yeah. first uh, two-day experience not having to work it. Yeah. Uh, I've just, I think that was – I feel like I've been there once before maybe, but I don't remember for sure. They all, they all run together. But I'm pretty sure this might have been my first time that had ever been to the Husker Harvest Day adventure that that's out there. So um, it is an adventure. It is an adventure. So Husker Harvest is a little bit different than other farm shows where they have um, a lot of harvest related demos that go on. You can see combines run and various other things, grain carts and whatnot, all in action while they're out there doing their thing. So it kind of gives a little bit of a, well, I don't know you want to call it like a test demonstration ish type thing out there. So it's the only totally irrigated farm show. True. Yeah, they do. They, they are heavy into irrigation at that farm show as well. All the the big ones are there without it. It would be pretty bleak sometimes. It would, (laughs) it would be right now. It's right on the line. You know what I mean? It's like, you're just far enough East that you catch some rains, but you're just far enough West that a little help from, from uh, uh, another source of water is always, Always greatly appreciated. Exactly. So let's run through a little bit of what you saw, what you and what were some of the things that jumped out to me. I'm gonna I'm going to the most innovative thing that I saw there that I thought and I'm not talking like some amazing technology, but just the innovation of it, I think to me was that um that ag multi trailer. That was there to me. That I thought that was of all the stuff we looked at. To me, I think that made the most the most sense and, and brought a an additional um, level of efficiency to you, to your operation by using one machine. So basically, it's a it's a gooseneck trailer, and they got a thirty five foot, fifty three foot, if I remember right. Yeah, that gooseneck or semi or semi, okay, yeah. And it is a uh, combination bell mover and regular just you know drop deck trailer right or a uh, uh, step deck trailer and you can you can do either or with it right you can haul the tractor and skid steer out to the wherever or you can put you know 18 round bells on it and take it down the road i thought that was from utilizing uh, multiple pieces of equipment into one thing to me made the most sense i really thought that was uh, probably one of the cooler things i saw out there absolutely <laughs> Another another thing that I liked was that uh, it shows you how how much drones are getting to be a big deal, right? That oh. that drone sprayer trailer that was just set up for drones. I think you could put like four or five drones on at the same time. Yeah, four, all, four on top. 
Yeah, four on top. And there was, you know, the big 10-foot diameter suckers, you know, that can haul whatever. I think you have to, uh, five gallons or whatever it is, 15 gallons or whatever it is that it hauls, you know, a fair amount. But it was, that was a pretty, again, not heavy on technology, but just adapting to what's going on around uh, the marketplace. Adapting to the technology. Right. Exactly. Yep. My biggest takeaway is where's everybody at? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. All of the majors, save for uh, Big Red, was incredibly disappointing. Yeah. The uh, everybody. I mean, honestly, the uh, Joe's Welding from Nowhere, Kansas, that has three things he slapped together Tuesday had as good of a display as anybody. Right. Yep. Logistics yeah. cost. I don't know what it is. Like the day, the internet's ru- the internet's ruining farm shows. That's what it is. <laughs> There's, there is a, uh, there was, you saw some things that were, were dramatically scaled back again, my first time being there. So I can, you know, I was expecting to see the, you know, the huge tent with, you know, all the, all the stuff, you know, but you know, you're right. I mean, you look at, at what New Holland had, you look at what Agco had, you look at what C8 or Case had on the Case side. And then you look at like Kubota, you know, I mean, I think probably if you want to really break it down, if I were looking at the majors as to what, Hey, what was going to be the ones that had the biggest splash on, you can't throw John Deere on the mix. Cause they weren't even there, but you know, you look at like nice Kate auction had, lot though. They did have a nice auction lot. <laughs> Stephas did have a nice lineup of John Deere equipment. They were going to sell <laughs> at the, at this thing. But you know, if you look at like, you know, where, where case had their stuff at, they right. had, a, they had a nice, they had a nice setup. Yeah. But case had by far, out of the majors, far and away the best. But I, I think Kubota rivaled that. Kubota um, was Kubota I mean, was there. They were they were there and they were serious. They were there to play. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so you look at where those things are at. Um, you know, New Holland. Take a look what they had there. Uh, when I look at their their setup, I mean, they had they had the the, the stuff there. They had had a sprayer and they had a couple tractors and a four drive and well, they and had uh, things. the big new combine there. Big new combine was there. Yeah, um, but the typical regalia that you would see of something like that is not didn't really come come out. Yeah, they they had like a pickup with a topper for mm-hmm. the booth. Yeah, and they had you know Agco's booth was all precision planning. It was a giant That's precision it. planning setup and an ideal combine and a fin tractor. There was so. no. Massey branded spray coupe, which was very disappointing. <laughs> right. So I was really looking forward to seeing that. Be like, after all these years, they finally make a sprayer. <laughs> but so when you look at it from that perspective, to me it was, you know, um there was I don't know. It just it, it felt like you could you could feel when you're and even when you're talking to the guys, you know, um you could talk you know, hey, we're we're cutting back. You know, economies this, economy that. We got, oh, yeah. we got those kind of things. Single yeah. place was that way. It didn't matter if you're talking to the Polaris Ranger guy or if you're talking to, um, you know, whoever. You know, right? Pick them. Um, that I will say though, I, I was kind of that that whole idea of that Macdon flexing cornhead thing was kind of cool. I like that was a, a unique, yep. a unique, a unique thing. And they just keep getting up. bigger, so yeah, we got to adapt. Yeah. So I thought that was cool. Um, Last thing about the show from me, we are not, we are, we are still a long ways from planner attachment shortages. <laughs> it's true. Yeah. There was plenty of, there's no lack of planner attachments out there. Why is this press wheel better? Cause it's orange. <laughs> okay. Yeah. It's uh there was, there was a lot of, a lot of planner attachments to be, to be seen in that part of the world. Um, but I think overall it felt like there was, I don't know what attendance normally looks like. So again, it's my first time going to one of these, but down, it was that, down quite that a bit. Was, that was way down. Usually on a Wednesday it is, you, you need dividers like a corn head on the front of you to get through the crowd. Mm-hmm. Yep. Now I probably think another highlight for me there was the, uh, 
was a Husker sandwich. You know, that was a, a good com- a good combination of a of a ground pork patty and a pork loin on top of that, right? No, it, it, it's a ground pork patty uh-huh. that has bacon in it. Oh, okay. There you go. Right. And then you had loin on top. Yeah, it was it was delicious. You I enjoyed that. A giant smile. <laughs> it was quite quite tasty. Uh, quite tasty. Um, no better way to finish a day walking ten miles. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. There was uh we ran in, ran into some cool people when we were there. You know, we got I got some business cards from some people that are going to see come on the podcast. We got some people lined up that are going to come on talk about drones and they're going to talk about some trailer stuff. The Redicop guys are going to talk about some stuff that they're doing uh, with their uh, with their chopper when it comes to breaking up the, uh, the the weed seeds as they come through and and what that looks like and how that works. Um, so. A lot of good stuff got came from the show that we're gonna have we're gonna highlight here on the uh Weaving Iron Podcast Machine Shed and uh get that whole, whole a lot thing of short line there. features. A lot of short line features. You know, we got ran some Dagelman guys, talk to them, got Otter Blade guys gonna come on, talk about that stuff there. So we're gonna have some blade technology coming through. Um so it's gonna be it's gonna be good. I I, I thought we had um from what was there, you know, there was some really innovative things that are coming down the pike that not just technology related, but just how, how they're trying to use, how these manufacturers are trying to use efficiencies and stuff that already exists to, to better, um, better format what's going on in the marketplace. So right. be very, very cool. All right, man, that's probably good enough for this segment. Aaron, if folks want to reach out to you, what's the best way to get a hold of you? Uh, call me, text me 308-760-1193. Uh, fairly active on the Twitterverse X, whatever you call it, the little black thing on your phone. At Aaron Fintel, A A Ron. Also on Facebook. Right on. Casey Seymour, you can find me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Well, X. I keep I, I got to stop saying Twitter. It's Twitter. It's the same difference. It's just instead of a blue bird, it's a black X now. So, mm-hmm. and so anyway. Find me there. Go to LinkedIn at Moving Iron Podcast. Check out the YouTube channel, which is the Moving Iron Podcast YouTube channel, and go to movingironllc.com for everything Moving Iron related. So check that out there. So Aaron, hey, man, we'll do this again here, and uh, we'll talk some more stuff about what's going on in the world of equipment as we get in, back into the machine shed. Right on. Are you looking to value your equipment more accurately, target the right buyers, and close more deals, reach your ideal customer, then look no further. Fusible isn't just about ag data. It's about action. Our best-in-class solution empowers you to value your equipment accurately, make informed decisions, and find the perfect prospects. Ignite your dealership's growth at fusible.com slash moving iron dash podcast. Moving iron. Moving iron auctions. Customer satisfaction is our number one goal as the 40-year leader in auctions for agriculture real estate, livestock, construction, and transportation, we are here to serve you. Big Iron will handle everything from start to finish, from meeting with you to prepping your equipment, writing the listings, and collecting buyer's payments. Let us do the heavy lifting for you. We love our customers, and we treat them like family. There's a Big Iron sales rep in your area, so let's get together. To learn more, visit BigIron.com. Hello, and welcome to Moving Iron Podcast. I'm uh, live here with uh, the Big Iron Group. Inside the uh, Big Iron Tent here at Tusker Harvest Day, we've got Ryan Harbor with you. Ryan, how you doing? I'm doing well. How are you doing today? Good, man. Glad you could be a part of this. I'm you glad bet. you guys invited me out here. This is a cool experience. It's my first on-site one I've done, so it's, it's a lot of fun for me. Absolutely. It's a great show. It's a great opportunity for us to connect with a lot of customers and obviously see all of the new enhancements in agriculture and yep. really kind of bring things full circle for guys before they come into the end of the year and start making some decisions. So. For, sure. for sure. You bet. So, Big Iron, auction company, obviously. Let's talk about what you see happening in the auction market so far. It's been a pretty festive 2024, I guess is the best way to put it. A lot of, a lot of stuff going on out there, a lot of, uh, a lot of retirement sales. There's a lot of, obviously, dealer sales and those kind of things. But yeah. overall auction activity, in my opinion, from where it started at early in, in 2024 to where it's at today, um, seems like a lot more auction activity than you would normally see this early in the year, I guess. So what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, you bet. So Absolutely. We've had a very busy year this year. Obviously, like you said, we came into the year pretty strong, but... As the year kind of progressed, we kind of kept seeing more and more activity, and obviously with the uh, you know the uptick in dealer auctions, that provided an opportunity that maybe we haven't done quite as much in the past. Of. 
um, you know, and, and which is fine. You know, the good thing is we've been able to come alongside several dealers and really help them um, manage some of their inventory and, and help get some of that stuff liquidated. So uh, yep. we've been able to really foster some good relationships there. And, and as we've kind of moved into the, you know, through the summer, we've kind of seen that remain pretty steady, really. Um, we haven't seen much of a downturn there. Um, I'm pretty excited actually to see what's going to happen this fall and on into the, to the later winter months, just because I think there's really some opportunities out there to still yep. see some really strong auction activity. And so uh, we're kind of anticipating it and we're actually starting to get pretty busy right now. Yeah. So. So talk, let's talk about auction activity. So we're in that peak auction cycle right now, that September to the end of December time frame. You know, guys are looking at the pre-harvest stuff. You're looking at stuff going into that last quarter of the year, that that uh, tax buying time. You know, you absolutely. That. What's your calendar look like right now as you guys look out towards the end of the year? Well, you're 100 percent right. So first and foremost, I mean, even this opportunity here at Husker Harvest Days this year has been great because. We were able to host a dealer and farmer auction here that we're going to sell next Tuesday. Um, it was a combination of dealers and farm customers that contributed to that auction. And to your point, when we move into harvest, we see a lot of buying activity. We see prices start to tick up, um, kind of some of those pre-harvest decisions being made. And uh, so that's been really busy and exciting for us. But to speak to your question about the end of the year, we're already seeing a huge level of interest in guys that are kind of contemplating retiring a little bit. It's on their mind, um, you know, and that's one thing that I would really say to anybody that is thinking about retiring is it's better to make that phone call sooner than later. Um, you know, if we're going to do the job that, that you want us to do, it's important that we start sooner than later. And so again, this show is a great opportunity for us because we do have a lot of those pre retirement conversations and guys are starting to kind of contemplate, you know, if this is my last harvest, what's my plan at the end of that? And so, yeah. Um, so yeah, moving into November, December, we're already seeing that auction calendar filling up pretty fast. Right. And so, yep. So if I'm a, if I'm someone thinking about contemplating the retirement, so, right, that's a big decision that has to be made, right? When you're, when you're actually going to get out of farming and kind of move on to that next chapter of your life, walk me through that process of what that looks like when you're talking with your customers. about that. Absolutely. So that's one thing that we really take a lot of pride in is, we really look at it as more of a privilege to be able to serve those people at the, at the pinnacle of their career, meaning, you know, at the, it's, it's everything they've worked for their entire life. And so we really enjoy sitting down with those people and really just having a conversation about really understanding what it is that they want to, you know, achieve with their retirement sale. And out of that information, we're able to ask really good questions and understand how we can best serve them. And so, you know, we'll usually start several weeks in advance. Um, we want to be sure that we're on point with all the details. And so we start those conversations, I would say months in advance if we can, um, just so that we can plan a, a, an exceptional auction event for that customer. And so that we can get, you know, get an exemplary res result in the end. So, so let's talk a little bit about the online strategy, right? Yeah. I remember when I first started in this business back 2006, 2005, in that time frame. Guy in the yellow shirt would come by the store once in a while and ask if we had anything that we wanted to put on sale. And I'm like, nah, we're not going to do the online thing. Is you know, that's what no one really pays attention to. Well, now you take you go move ahead 20 years where it's at now, and it's the biggest thing on the planet. So as you're taking a look at how your journey from you know the time that you've been with Big Iron from where it was at seven years ago to where we're at today. Talk a little bit about that evolution. Absolutely. So it's interesting that you bring that up because prior to working at Big Iron, I actually spent 16 years in the John Deere dealer world. Okay. And so for the longest time, I somewhat discounted what the online auction was doing in the equipment industry. Right. Um, I had a couple customers come in, you know, Hey, I'd throw them a trade price. They'd be like, Oh, I don't know. I might put it on big iron. I'm like, ah, what's big iron, you know, not anything I need to worry about. And okay. so, um, you know, as we watched the evolution of it, one of the things that really intrigued me was I started to watch the buying and the purchasing habits of not only the guys that are my age, but the next generation, right? And everything in our society today is very somewhat instant gratification, right? So with the touch of a button on a mobile device, we can find what we want, where we want it for the price that we want it. Right. And so as I kind of started to observe those trends, I was very intrigued by the, by the migration, if you will, towards the online auction industry, because yeah. I've watched those generations just more and more go to looking at that online piece. 
And from the business perspective, it helps us reach such a larger group of people, um, not to take away from what the traditional open outcry options would have accomplished back in the day, because there were some great auctioneers. Obviously, our founders were open outcry auctioneers before Big Iron. And so, but we, we know and understand that if we want to be able to market at a high level today, if we want to be able to get our customers the most money for their equipment, we got to be able to reach a huge audience. And yeah. the online piece accomplishes that. Yeah. I think the one thing I've, I've watched with the evolution of the online auction is just like you said, it opens up the doors to so many, so many audiences that you wouldn't would never touch if you were just doing it like in your local county or whatever. You know, um, used to be you go to an auction and it was an event for that a little, you know, maybe a, a sixty mile radius was kind of about a, the touch point. Now, now you're talking about selling stuff to people in, in Hungary or Romania or wherever. You know, Absolutely. they're buying stuff online, and so I mean, I'm sure you guys see that that the bids where they're coming from, and there's a good portion of those bids are international bids. Absolutely. You know, one of the things I was really intrigued by was, you know, we we get very locked in geographically to what happens in our immediate area. And when I left the dealer world and came to the online auction world. I kind of was stuck in what happens in central Nebraska, not right. realizing what happens not only in the rest of the country, but worldwide. Mm -hmm. And so as we would see pieces of equipment that maybe had somewhat lost their relevance in our local geography, we would see buyers from the Ukraine mm -hmm. or from overseas that would be picking up these pieces of equipment that in the United States, we probably saw them as, as somewhat less relevant, right. you know, in today's production agriculture. And so it was interesting to watch that evolution and to yeah. see, you know, where that's headed as well. And, and that's what's so powerful about the online platform is we can reach those people. We can find that buyer for that piece of equipment that maybe might not perform as well at a local level, but mm -hmm. performs very well at an international level. Yep. And that's, and there's some stuff there too. When you take a, that's the other thing about the, the online side of the auction marketplace that you see is just like what you talked about. There could be a piece that used to be a big deal here. And, but now it's moved to say, maybe, maybe, you know, Montana or something like Absolutely. that. And that's where you're doing maybe more bean production or something like that. And you're seeing more edible beans being produced in Montana for the specific piece of equipment. You can now have a set of eyes that see that and can, and can make a bid on it and, and help that, that piece. Absolutely. You know, get sold for, for more money. You know, that's, Absolutely. That's, that's the name of the game when you're doing it. You bet. You know, and one thing I, I appreciated something that you said there about kind of the traditional auction. One thing that we do at Big Iron, you know, particularly to kind of touch back on the retirement thing for a minute is it was very much a community event. And that's one thing we really still love to do, you know, prior to the auction, a couple of days out, we'll, we'll host that event still, you know, we'll still have the community, the family, yeah. um, you know, everybody stop by and check yeah. out the equipment. Um, but what's, nice is it takes a little bit of that pressure off on auction day you know the seller can kind of just sit back and enjoy watching his auction because yeah. you know historically the seller was probably all over the place trying to answer this guy's question or that guy's question I mean, so, um, it's been again interesting to watch the evolution of that so. Right. so let's talk about this real quick so you, you're in a in a space now where you're looking at over amount the overall amount of inventory that's out there in the market right yeah and there's not a big secret. There's a lot of inventory out there, right? So as you have you watched your amount of equipment that you've seen come through auction? Have you seen that increase, decrease, start to plateau? Kind of what are you seeing right now from the start of the year to where we're at now as far as inventory and auctions go? You know, I think at the beginning of the year, there was a lot of inventory available. Um, I think dealers and farmers alike have very systematically worked through that over the last eight months. Um, I think I would say from my perspective, we're in a bit of a holding pattern right now. Um, probably just a short window, I'd say probably 45 to 60 days um, before we see that next big push, if you will. Um, I do think there's still enough inventory on the ground that the auction sure. activity is going to be pretty robust still. Yeah. Um, I have no doubts that we're going to see a lot of action at, or auction activity late November through December, probably even into January, honestly. Um, you know, just as we kind of watch, um, you know, just the, the equipment market as a whole, um, there's been a little bit of positivity breathed back into it. We've actually seen a little bit of uptick in, in participation in prices. And so I think that, you know, again, for what's available out there, um, I think we're going to see a lot of activity at the end of the year again. Yeah. So, yeah, and I, and I agree with what you just said. I think it feels like to me as I watch the auction activity right now, it feels like it's plateaued a little bit. Yeah. Um, it doesn't feel like prices have really changed a bunch. You haven't seen a lot of things move around, but it feels like there's people just kind of waiting to see like, what's, what's the next shoe to drop. And then Absolutely. let's make that decision as we move into there. As you're looking through the overall kind of 
spectrum of, of where you things are where you think things are headed between now and the end of the year. Where do you still feel like there's going to be a, a big supply of large ag machines that come into play on the auction value, or do you feel like there's going to be maybe more of a wait and see till after the first year? I guess what's your thoughts there? Um, I mean, generally speaking, if we're talking about more of like a retail sales environment, I think you're going to see some guys hold up a little bit just to yeah. see what they can sell at the end of the year or what they can retail. Um, I think people are pretty cognizant of the fact that they're going to have to go trade for some stuff. Yeah. And so you've got to manage your inventory. I mean, the biggest thing in that, in that environment is, is turn and you need to turn that inventory. And if it can't turn, you really got to help it turn because you can't sit on it forever. I mean, if it's putting roots in the ground or if it's having a birthday, <laughs> it's time. Yeah. And so for sure, that's right. For sure. So when you're looking at, um, so as you look out through the beginning, beginning of 2025, and you kind of see what's coming up. What are your thoughts about how 24 is going to compare to 25? I guess how 25 is going to compare to 24. What are your thoughts there? I think you're going to probably, just my my projection would be, you're going to continue to see inventory levels get back in check. Yeah. I think you're going to see the pricing stabilize, right. honestly. Um, you know, I don't think we're going to see erratic highs or erratic lows. I mean, you're always going to have those pieces that are highly sought after that are always going to perform at a really, really high level, probably higher than they should. But one thing that I, you know, the conversation that I had so consistently over the last several months has been the fact that, you know, the perception became, well, maybe things on auction aren't performing as well as they were, but it was just the natural correct well, yeah. where they should have been. Yeah. And so, you know, it was... It's, it's kind of coaching folks about, hey, you know, it's it doesn't have anything to do with low prices. It has everything to do with the correction to the true market, yeah. you know. And, and yeah. obviously at Big Iron, that's what we showcase is sure. in an unreserved buyer environment, we let the, the economy drive the price. So. This, I mean, I just, I said the same conversation with guys the other day, you know, it's like, it's like stock market has a huge run up. So, you know, there's a correction that comes back down. Yeah. That's kind of what we see. And agriculture's got that. Yeah. Feels like you got three to five years of, of some really decent times, and you've got five to seven years of some some bad times. So somewhere in there, there's a ten year span of good and good and bad in there that kind of mix together, and that's what we've seen here. So yeah, I'm, I think what you said is I agree with. You. Well, I think we can be confident that. Nothing will stay high too long, and right. nothing will stay too low too long. Right. Because yeah. if it does, we probably got a bigger problem. <laughs> like the old adage, you know, the cure to low price is low price. That's right. You know, that's right. There you so, go. You bet. Okay. Well. Ryan, if folks want to reach out to you, what's the best and easiest way to do that? So the best way to, is to go to our website, bigiron.com. Um, if you have equipment you'd like to sell, um, or if, even if you're looking to buy something, just reach out to us. We're more than happy to help. We want to assist you on both sides. So if there's something you're looking for, we obviously have eyes on our inventory and know what we're working on and what we're listing. The best resource is our website for sure, bigiron.com. You can see all of our upcoming auctions. Um, we try to post everything that we know about as soon as we know about it because we want our sellers to have as much advertising runway as possible. Sure. And, you know, particularly coming into the year end when people are making buying decisions, if I'm a guy that's in the hunt for, say, a John Deere 8530, I want to be, have visibility on, what, on what's available out there before I might make a decision that I don't want to make. And so, you know, I might wait or hold off if I see a low hour piece coming up. And so we try to be pretty transparent about that. But the best resource by far is our website, BigIron.com. Right on. And then why well, I meant to ask this question earlier when we were talking about this, so I'll ask it here then. If I want to sell something today, what's that? How much time? What's, what's generally the right? Is it, am I talking about 90 days out, 60 days out, 30 days out? Like, typically, what's the best strategy, in your opinion, to really get eyes on my piece of equipment? You know, if you're talking about just selling a singular piece of equipment, I would say you could expect probably overall start to finish probably about a seven-week process. Okay. Um, if we're talking about a larger scale auction, whether that's a dealer inventory reduction auction, whether that's a retirement sale, an estate sale, anything of that nature that has a little bit more detail um, associated with it, um, you know, we'd take 60 days to 90 days ahead of our listing date if we could and then market for a month after that you know we want to we really want to be on top of those larger projects you know the nice thing about big iron is we're a weekly marketplace like we have 52 auctions a year yeah guaranteed and so um plus all of our single seller events that happen on other days than wednesday and so uh, we have a variety of tools that we can use to really accommodate whatever your situation is the biggest thing is we want to have enough time to do the best job for our customers as we possibly can. Sure. Yep. Yes, absolutely. 
All right, so go to BigIron.com. It'll get you directed where you need to go, whether you want to sell equipment or land. Yeah, absolutely. Go from there. Or livestock or collector cars. There you go. Livestock. Got it all. Got it all covered here, Big Iron. That's right. Brian, it's nice to meet you, man. Hey, I bet. It was a pleasure. Thank Thanks you. Thanks for having me on the podcast. So I'm Casey Seymour with Moving Iron Podcast. Check me out on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Moving Iron LLC. Get a LinkedIn to Moving Iron Podcast. You can also go to uh, the website, MovingIronLLC.com, and see everything Moving Iron related there. So with that, I'm Casey Seymour with Ryan Harbor. Move some iron, folks. Out. Today, there are many ways to finance ag equipment, but nobody delivers simple, fast, or flexible financing like AgDirect. Learn more about your options to buy, lease, and refinance equipment at agdirect.com. Moving iron. Out in the field, every decision counts. You wouldn't plant without testing your soil, so why would you prospect blind? Introducing EDA your one-stop shop for ag equipment intel. EDA goes beyond specs and prices. You get deep dive data on every piece of equipment like UCC filings that help track ownership changes and uncover potential sales leads. D&B firmographics, which help you understand the financial health and buying power of potential customers. Market trends that help you stay ahead of the curve and insights on equipment demands and pricings. With EDA, you're not just looking at data, you're seeing opportunity. You find the right buyer, sell smarter, and build lasting relationships. Visit edadata.com for your free demo and unlock the power of knowledge. All right, hello, and welcome back to the Machine Shed here. I've got Cy Hanna with me. I had a little technical difficulty to start with, so I had to do the push the old re-record button here, but Cy, glad you had time to come back, man. Yeah, no, thanks for having me back. No big deal. Yeah, all right, man. Appreciate you being here. Um, let's start with this first. Talk a little bit about what your position is, you are the general manager of remarketing for RDO on the on the construction side of the business, correct? Yeah, I have construction and ag uh, okay. responsibility. So, you know, wear a few different hats, but, you know, essentially, you know, my teams are responsible for, you know, remarketing our, our aged equipment, our trade equipment, segment, you know, that's that's the, our main focus. Gotcha. I got you. Okay. So talk a little bit about obviously RDO's large organization. Basically, you have a pretty big footprint, um, basically west of Mississippi, kind of go across there everywhere. Yeah. So as you're looking at at the marketplace right now, um, some news kind of came out. You know, we got we got this uh, uh, rate reduction coming our way, um, knocking it down a half a point. That's a big move um, if you think about what it is. Still, it's stretch is still in the on a fairly elevated range. You know, we're looking at. Probably somewhere in the in the low sixes is what you know we're going to see things settle out to. I guess as you look at this information side from your perspective, looking at used equipment, some folks, you know, if you go back eighteen months from now or eighteen months ago and start looking at some of these guys were were uh, buying stuff at you know seven point seven five percent and seven point eight percent, some using seven point nine percent stuff out there for a little bit, but you start looking at this and and the gaps that you start seeing are starting to contract. I guess, what are your thoughts on, you know, we probably need to see one more of these before we really get a big a big wave in any direction at all. But as you look at this interest rate thing, what are your thoughts and, and what you saw come out of the Fed yesterday? Yeah, no, I mean, I think it's a positive step. You know, they're, they're you know, a half a point, it, it, you know, kind of is what it is. There might be a, a massive impact. But I think, you know, the market was looking for, for something positive to happen, something, something to trend in the positive direction, you know, to maybe uh, – you know, to uh, help with some of the hesitancy, you know, yeah. had, you know, um, at, you know, at this point, you know, when you're talking about high interest rates, you're talking about, you know, inflation, you're talking about price increases, you know, I think it's nice to see one of those give up a little bit and maybe spur some business. You know, we might be looking at some refinance situations coming in the future. We might look at a person that's, you know, uh, got a trade in that half a percent, you know, is that one little tick that gets him over to, you know, to go ahead and yeah. get something in and get something different, you know. So uh, I like it. You know, maybe there's more to come. But I think it's a, you know, a positive thing for the industry. For sure. And the other side of it, too, it doesn't really matter what happens with with the markets, per se. You know, what happens to the ag market or happens on the, on the construction side as far as business goes. When interest rates come down and people start refinancing that stuff, there's more money that go, is going to go back into their operations. So, there is definitely some some organic cash growth anyway that we can see with inside inside these businesses, which is going to be 
it's going to be good for everybody when it when yeah. a lot of stuff comes around. Yeah, no doubt. You know, uh, you know, the, the, you know, from the manufacturing, you know, from a dealer's seat, <laughs> you know, when we're, you know, we're partnering with our, you know, manufacturing partners to help, you know, pull us through some of this. You know, right now a lot of that help is coming through financing. You right. know, and those dollars are spent with, you know, with. Uh, you know, uh, trying to get a more attractive interest rate, and and this could help with that as well. You know. Yep, for sure, for sure. So, pay attention to that. We'll see what things how shake out here going yeah. towards the end of the year. But there could be some some just good natural movement just for used equipment, just based on you know refinancing some of this uh, higher interest rate stuff and trading in and getting some stuff moving that way. So, definitely some stuff to pay attention to there. All right, so so let's talk about this for a minute. Here here we are. Um, Plenty of stuff going on right now. You start looking at construction sites. I don't care where, what city you're in. It feels like they're building stuff as fast as they can build it, especially the major metropolitan areas. Um, you start looking at, at how some of this construction equipment stuff plays into the mix and what you saw happening there. I guess as you're looking at this side, if, if where where do you think – some of this real, you know, nuts and bolts stuff that you're going to see out there, the wheel loaders, uh, the dozers, motor graders, excavators, those kind of things. How do you feel that market is right now? Do you feel like there's a strong demand for used equipment? Do you feel like auction values are where they need to be at? Are they, I mean, anyway, from a, from a fluctuation standpoint, are they kind of started to bottom a little bit on the construction side? How do you see the overall market right now for those machines? Yeah, no, I mean, it, you know, you, you, you know, you kind of said it there. It's, it's, uh, you know, there is work happening, you know, whether it's, you know, driving down the interstates, you see work happening, whether you're, you know, traveling through airports, every single airport you go to, there's work happening, you know, just a couple examples. But the sentiment is there's a ton of work out there and that's still the case, right? You know, so, um, uh, you know, if you get the work, you know, you, you, you gotta, you gotta, you know, some work in progress, you know, the industry is, is, you know, I'd call it flat, maybe slack, slightly down. Um, you know, our industry, our inventory levels are, are growing, but they're not to the levels they were, you know, pre COVID. So, um, you know, you are seeing some construction yards, you know, fill up a little bit. You know, the rental game in the construction world is a massive thing, right? And, you know, so utilization is good. You know, there, there are some uh, areas in our footprint to where, you know, the, the industry numbers are down a little bit, but there's also some that the industry is up some, you know. So, you know, you know, I, I think we're kind of flat, you know, we're, we're kind of budgeting the flat, you know, flat maybe slightly down, you know, from last year. But, um, you know, there's two data points that I kind of like to look at. Um, and, and they're kind of encompassed in one, um, you know, equipment uh, uh, equipment uh, value index. And, and what that reads is, you know, the, the amount of inventory and its asking price and the gap between that and what the auction values are. Yep. Well, and, you know, that gap is, is big with ag equipment, right? Uh, construction equipment is not, you know, near as bad. So, you know, the, the gap between retail and auction, you know, you know, it has its, you know, you know, not where we want it to be, you know, it's manageable. So, um, you know, some of the auction values are, you know, when I say down there, I mean, you know, month over month, just a percent or two, you know, nothing right. crazy. So, yep. you know, we're managing through the construction seems to be like a, you know, a slow moving train right now, still moving forward. You know, maybe it speeds up, maybe it slows down some, but. Yeah, we're finding business. There's work out there. The dealers are being creative. Um, you know, so we're optimistic about, you know, where we're headed from a construction standpoint. For sure. <clears throat> so I know we, as you look at the market right now, I think from on the ag side, stuff going in onto the, onto the farm, you know, people immediately think of, okay, skid steers. That's a pretty common thing that comes in off there. But if you look at some of these operations and how they're, how they're moving along, you see wheel loaders, you're seeing some motor graders, you're seeing some dozers, you're seeing excavators, you're seeing backhoes, all, all that kind of stuff starts to show up. As you look at the marketplace, um, is there any one of those machines out there where they're a little bit hotter than another? Because I guess the reason I'm asking this question is the use on farm versus the use on construction site, depending on what it is, um, 
and where it came from on the ag side. If it came out of a dairy, there's a ton of hours on it. But if it just came out of a, a regular, um, you know, row crop operation, you, know, you put 800 hours on a five-year-old skid steer and, and you're really trying there. If you put 800 hours on a construction piece of equipment, that's, you know, that's a you know, three or four months worth of, up worth of use, right? Yeah. When you're looking at this and you had that conversation with customers on both sides, how, how are you, how are you navigating that? Right. Cause you see, you know, a two year old machine that's got 3,500 hours on, you see a two year old machine over here that's got you know, 250 hours on it. There's this big gap in there. How, how are you, how are you adjusting for that? How do you have that conversation and, and, and how do you go about having that, you know, to tell the tape, I guess, for lack of a better term, when you're looking at ag use on construction equipment and then, you know, construction use on construction equipment? Yeah, no, uh, you know, uh, you know, I guess in my mind, and you know, excluding a dairy, you know, dairy, you know, the dairies have loaders and they run when they're running, they're running constantly, right? And yeah. so they're calculate, you know, they're they're running, you know, in construction world, it's, you know, it's all about production, so they're running hours up. You know, if, if a person was in, you know, if you're speaking about availability and you know a machine that you wanted to buy with low hours, hours, you know, or in between. Uh, uh, you know, the availability of wheel loaders is there, you know, uh, it didn't, you can throw a dart in a map and wherever it lands, there's somebody that needs, you know, a wheel, right. loader, somebody that needs, right. you know, some sort of excavator, you know, that's the construction wheelhouse, you know, and as far as inventory, you know, increases, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe a, the wheel loader market is probably where we're seeing some of that inventory increase currently, uh, maybe the most. Okay. Um, but you know, you know, not that not that a farmer needs a motor gun, but you know, I throw them in the mix as well. Every, you know, every every uh, every municipality, every small town, every big town, every, every road job, you're going to see a, a wheel loader, you're going to see a motor grader, you know, you're going to see backhoes, and so yep. you know, uh, you know, if, if a farmer needs one of those, they're not hard to find. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, the one thing I've noticed more on farms here of late more than anything is, is how many motor graders are getting shipped over. He's kind of switched over to farms with the amount of roads and these guys have to maintain. Uh, yeah. You start looking at guys you know, build, building terraces and whatnot with them. Um, you're seeing it might not be, you know, a one year old motor grader by any means, but, you know, they're talking 25 year old motor grader or something like that. There could be a, a 10 or 15 year old motor grader in the mix, but more and more of those motor graders are starting to show up on on farms more than I I've seen probably in my, my career doing this. Yeah. No, we, it's funny, you know, we, we you know, the, the, the industry's kind of worked through, you know, you know, tier three and then worked through, you know, uh, interim yeah. tier four. And now we're in sure. tier, you know, tier four. And, and, you know, those, those older motivators, man, they don't stay on a yard fast. You know, those yeah. owner operators, ranchers, farmers, they chew them up and they, you know, like you said, they never have put a hundred, couple hundred hours on them a year and they'll last them a decade. So, right. It's a good, yep. it's a good, uh, good machine to have on hand, for sure. So one thing too about motor or on the the wheel loader side of it is is the high lift capacity, right? That's always that's always a term. Everyone asks that question, like, hey, talk about high lift. What's the guy for high lift? That's a bigger, bigger part of the whole spectrum, but it's not a common. Uh, functionality on a machine unless it's in a dairy, right? And that's it yeah. there. It's pretty common there. But as you look at the entire spectrum of, of wheel loaders across that, that's just a small thing. And then also third function hydraulics isn't necessarily always a common thing either. But if you look at it from a farming operation, those two things are about about 100% of the time. That's what you need. So I guess if you're working with somebody right now, how are you going to go about that that search? Where, do you, where are you looking at? How much stuff are you drawing in and out every day that, that kind of has that spec on there? Because it seems like if I look at 10 wheel loaders, maybe one of them have, have that, that functionality on. Yeah. You know, so, you know, you know, from, from our seat, you know, when we, when we are ordering, you know, uh, any model group, you know, on this point, uh, wheel loaders, you know, we're, we're, we're ordering that group for our rental fleet. We're ordering it for our construction rental fleet. You know, mm-hmm. that we do have a percentage of wheel loaders that are high lift. You know, I don't know the exact percentage, but it's a small percentage, you know, of what we order for, you know, our construction customers. Um, I'll tell you, you know, when they when they come back in on trade or, or we source them, um, they don't last long for the exact point that you just said, you know. Yep. So, I mean, um, you know, 
if somebody's in need of that, I mean, your your dealers will will have them from time to time, and, and you know can source some. But you're right, you know, you're, you're going to pay a premium, and it might take you a second to find one. But that's the reason, you know, we're building out these rental fleets, and we try to have the commonality of spec. The trails go from location to location. You know, our willow fleet, you know, is is very large, uh, and there is a portion of it that that will will spec high lift. Uh, most of it is to be interchangeable, you know, and most of it is to fit our vehicle model. And so that's why, you know, it, you know, it may seem like we should have more. That's kind of the mindset of why we, we may not at times, but we do, we do get them. Yeah. And the mindset, especially what you're talking about there is, um, it, where, where's your business at on the actual, on your wheel loader business, right? What's that look like? And the majority of that's on the construction side, you know, and sure. I think that's the, that's the thing about it. unless you're dealing with a dairy, right? Or, or a yeah. feedlot operation or something like that. But, and they're going to order that specific spec though. And they're going to order a machine the way they want it. It's going to show up, you know, cause they have, you know, discounts and everything else that come along with that. So right. it's a big play in that. The last thought here, size, we kind of work through this through the end of the year. There's going to be some of the end of the year buying we see every year. Um, you're going to be guys out there looking for some stuff. What advice would you have for the guy out there looking for that, that wood loader, that motor grader, whatever it might be? I got, you know, want to spend a few extra dollars here on some stuff. What kind of advice would you have for them going through the end of the year as they go through some purchasing um, opportunities and some, uh, some different strategies that might come up uh, through now and the end of the year? Yeah. You know, I, you know, I, I, I've got to tell you, you know, uh, Sometimes I guess I'd tell our neighbors, you know, I would definitely work with your local dealer. You know, there's other avenues to find one. You know, I think your local dealers are going to check more of the boxes for you. You know, they'll be able to, you know, fit you with, you know, exactly what you need. They'll be able to take care of you, you know, throughout, you know, your ownership process, support you through that. You know, you'll feel good about knowing the machine health, you know, for its, you know, from its, inception to when you buy it you know the other thing is you know if you're looking for zero hours or ten thousand hours you know that's going to be you know the, the the optimal place to find that machine and know that you're going to be able to have confidence in it you know that there's you know i guess it's the same for everything you know the the dealer support after the purchase is very very important and uh, knowing what you're buying is equally as important and and that's where you're going to find that yeah for sure well, so I appreciate you taking time to come on the podcast and talk about what you see happening in the construction marketplace. If folks want to reach out to you, Sai, what's the easiest way to do that? Yeah, no, uh, you can email me. It's shanna at rdoequipment.com. Uh, my phone number is 254-723-1922. Right on. And you, Casey, you see where you can find me at Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Moving Iron LLC. Go to LinkedIn at Moving Iron Podcast. Watch the YouTube channel, which is Moving Iron Podcast YouTube channel. And you can find everything Moving Iron related at movingironllc.com. So with that, I'm Casey Seymour with Cy Hanna. It's going to be some iron folks. Out. Often a lack of power sneaks up on an engine like gray hair does on a person. One day it becomes very apparent. This problem could also include an increase in fuel usage and a degradation in idle quality. The cause can be very elusive since the engine sounds fine and compression and cylinder lead down tests prove inconclusive, just showing normal wear. When you cannot find anything wrong but you know what there is, think out of the box and evoke these tips. For a diesel to run properly, it requires the necessary amount of fuel. If the delivery is weak, then the engine will not be itself. Most think of a clogged fuel filter or corrupted water separator, which can be valid culprits, but few consider aerated fuel. This describes fuel that is not a solid stream, but instead is mixed with air. When air is introduced into the fuel, it not only displaces the combustible fluid, but causes an ebb and flow of the amount getting to the injection pump or common rail system. Splashing of the fuel in the tank along with any return fuel can cause aeration. It can also be the root cause of a change in performance when the fuel level is very low. This is a normal phenomenon that an efficient lift pump has the ability to negate.
If you suspect fuel aeration, the easiest way to diagnose it would be to install a sight glass between the lift pump and the engine. If there is an excessive amount of bubbles, you then need to backtrack. Air can be introduced into the fuel via cracked or degraded pickup tube in a fuel tank, loose fuel fitting, or cracked or loose water separator or any other region in the pathway that it travels. Temporarily bypass each section of the fuel line until the bubbles disappear. I'm Ray Bohax from the Idle Chatter Podcast. For over 80 years, Iron Solutions has been your go-to data source for ag dealers, lenders, and manufacturers. Get powerful appraisal and value forecasting tools that fuel profitable decisions anytime, anywhere. Get your free demo at ironsolutions.com. Iron Solutions, confidence in every click. Moving Iron. Hello and welcome to Moving Iron Podcast. I got Rich Possum back on here and I couldn't help myself. I had to give him a call with the uh, Fed rate cut. I wanted to get Rich's two cents on what he saw happen there and then what the reaction to the market was and then what his thoughts were. And, you know, Rich, it was a bit of a surprise. Of, I, think, I think surprise is probably the right word. I mean, I think some people anticipated that maybe this would happen. But everyone was pretty locked in on a quarter percent uh, drop in rates, but we saw a half percent. And I guess, Rich, as you look at that, were you surprised by that? And then, you know, what's your overall reaction to what you saw from the Fed? I was somewhat surprised, uh, also pleased. I went with the idea, along with most people, saying let's just assume a quarter of a point. Right. I'm going to walk this down slowly. But I felt, you know, personally, I thought if I was running the show, I'd knock it down a half a point. And because I could always slow down later, I can skip right. some of the next meetings, not do anything for a while, but send that message. Hey, we're on top of this. And so it, it was surprising when it came out. Yet at the same time, I thought, but that's what they should do anyway. <laughs> so, right. Um, right. And we'll see. But uh, here's what surprised me a bit more is if you listen to what Powell said, if you look some of the writing and stuff coming out of the Federal Reserve, their, their dot maps and so forth, they're pretty much projecting they can do another half a point by the end of this year. So, so I believe question. the yeah. only meetings yeah. we have is November, December. So they can either do a quarter point each month or half a point one of those months. But that would be pretty impressive. Now, of course, they don't have to do that. But there's the Taylor rule that a lot of people have been concerned that the Federal Reserve is running behind, way behind. And the Taylor rule is suggesting the Federal Reserve should be at 4% now. Uh, they were talking this 30 days ago. Uh, and so on one hand, it sends a message. Maybe they're looking at those things saying, hey, we're a bit behind here. Let's get caught up quickly, send that message. So when I, when I saw that half a percent, I was pleased long term, but on a short term, made me nervous. There's going to be people out there thinking, oh, must be the Fed is getting nervous now. And, oh, maybe things are going to slip in our economy for a while before all these lower interest rates help out and turn things around. Looking at how the stock market handled it, it went up first thing. Then it just faded back and pulled back. And a lot of people on Wall Street were just saying, well, that's the typical behavior of buy the rumors, sell the news, just like they do in commodities. But they held it pretty good at the end of the day. And then what's astonishing to me, and more of a surprise than the Federal Reserve, was they put the stock market up a huge amount overnight. And I just thought, boy, somebody's really caught on the wrong side of this market here. They, they, they were really shocked by the half a point decline, but they didn't dare do anything that day of the Fed. They waited after the close. And during the night, they kind of like pressured one another to buy, buy, buy. Right. And I think they just wanted time to think about it. You know, these days we assume, boy, if you can't make a decision in five seconds, you're left behind. But it's fascinating to me how some of this data – it takes some people days to figure it out still, even with all this computerization and math and everything. Things aren't as, quite as fast as some people think. You do have some time to, uh, to consider things and look at the options. Uh, so even though that was very aggressive, putting the stock market up overnight, and I thought that's a vote of confidence, Fed's on the right track, we're not going to hurt, the economy's not going to fall apart, and the Fed's too slow – at the same time, as I told my subscribers, is when you put it up that much, you're going to scare away demand from the stock market. 
because it's just too fast for them. They're going to say, you know what? I want to buy this, but I'm not going to do, I'm not going to pay you that high price. I'm not walking in at the open and saying, wow, the market's up a huge amount. I'm going to buy it anyways. Right. There was, there was some buying there, but it wasn't as good as demand as one might think. The market just basically sat there for the rest of the day yesterday, uh, hanging on those gains. No question about it. The seller was more scared of selling. He was not so sure it's time to do it. But the buyer was also saying, not so sure this is time to do this. <laughs> right. Yeah. So uh, the interesting things today, the market's easing back a little. Interest rates are moving a little bit higher, which I'm sure is surprising some people with the Fed finally cutting. Uh, why would interest rates be going up? Well, the interest rate now has to take care of its own business in the bond market. It's the supply and demand of bonds. And so I think you can see a little stability. My model's been warning of that, that it could be stable to higher after the Fed Reserve. And it looks like it's trying to do it. I don't think that's going to cause a problem here for the stock market. But I am looking for moments, just brief moments, the stock market can drop. Because normally in September, October, the market has some problems. It makes, normally makes too big of a deal out of stuff. So we still have to watch out for that. But overall, um, you know, as a stock investor, I um, the Fed did what, what it should do, and I'm not coming up with anything that's going to hurt this U.S. economy. It looks strong, yeah. and uh, it is slowing down in certain measurements, but that's what we wanted. It was running a little too hot, but I got a feeling this market, this economy is going to stay somewhat hot uh, to about normal in terms of economic growth for a while yet. And I don't know, that may mean the Fed doesn't lower interest rates as much as some people think going into next year. And I don't see a, a gigantic cut. But I do think the Fed is kind of following the line with that Taylor rule that's saying, yeah, their, their rate should be at 4% and maybe lower. And I, I can see maybe the interest rates we're getting in our bank accounts might drop as low as 3% by the end of next year, but I don't think any lower than that. For, for people who are worried we're going back to the old days of sub 2%, I'm down to 0%. No, economy's going to hang in there enough. Inflation's still going to linger now. Yeah, we're getting inflation back to 25 but it can fluctuate around 2% for a very long time. And I don't think 2% is a reason to assume we ought to have 2% interest rates, okay? Right. So, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm quite comfortable. I, I I've said all along, I've got to be bullish next year in the stock market. And I don't know why I've had this gut feeling of 18% from now into whatever the highest price is next year. And in other words, not all of that 18% for 2025. But uh, I'm not so sure I can really explain it that well. I come up with scenarios of 15%, over 20%, stuff like that. But I did read Goldman Sachs uh, made a comment yesterday saying when the Fed cuts – at the time that you're pounding out record highs of the stock market, and they went back decades, every single time the market was up the next year, and I think they set an average of 18%. So I got to go figure out what, what were they really doing because here I had this gut feeling 18%, and then they show 18%. So <laughs> got some work there to figure out, uh, are we on the same page? How did we do this, you know? Yep. But, uh, you know, I'm overall pleased with what the Fed does. I think the country has to be has to be pleased with it. But I think the question we all have to make now is where are we going from here in the sense of what's going to make the stock market go higher? Can it go higher just because of lower interest rates? I say somewhat yes, but we want to keep an eye on our economy and how it's grown and be prepared for some negative news from day to day that can upset. And that's normally how the market works anyways. If we're looking for what's going to be something that might catch us off sides here, off guard, what, what could really create some drama? Uh, I'm reviewing some work put out by some macro economists here. It's not my work, but I, I, I kind of agree with them that we got to watch it, but I think they're overreacting a bit. But they, uh, it's on China and China's real estate, uh, their tier two classification of real estate prices are down to where it was eight years ago. Uh, so anybody's been buying real estate all that time, they can't be too happy as of this morning. <laughs> okay. Uh, anybody okay. buying now, they're probably happy to see that pull back. But I'm saying the bulk of Chinese aren't very happy what's going on with their real estate prices. Now, the other thing is you look at their stock market and it's hovering somewhere around, I think, price levels of 2018. 
Yeah, look at the U.S. We're knocking out record high prices. Look at Europe and some of these other countries. They've had tr uh, tremendous rebounds since uh, COVID. So the Chinese investor is not feeling very good. And if they're looking at their real estate and, and I think their real estate is about uh, 20 something percent of uh, probably all of their assets uh, and what a normal family would have, uh, their retirement money, their cash on hand and their homes. Uh, so that 23 percent's been hammered. And then they look at their stock market saying, well, gee, I haven't made any money in several years. <laughs> so, you know, uh, the bottom line is you can see at least why the young people are kind of depressed in, in China, okay? And they're not pleased with their leadership and where it's going. And why is their leadership doing that? Uh, the head of China favoring this. It has been, in a way, something that might actually be smarter than the rest of us around the world, but at the same time, you can see it wasn't necessary to do. I think what they want is to make sure they don't have as much leverage in the real estate markets or stock market, things that can cause a crash like 1929. Um, they want to uh, just protect themselves more than other countries. They want a cooler economy. And if their people don't like it, they're saying too bad. <laughs> so, you know, uh, we're just, they're just not going to let them do as well. Uh, they're just concerned, and then rightly so, because they built a gigantic real estate market way beyond what they really needed. So they understand their risk, uh, but they can also be overdoing it. And this is what's tricky about being a central bank, being a government, trying to manage your country. You can try to do what's right, but if the people aren't happy about it, you're going to have a problem. So, yeah. <laughs> you know, and it's like you kind of have to give in at times and go along with it. Uh, so I'm still kind of optimistic China's going to kind of pull out of the gutter here <laughs> uh, next year and the following year. But I don't think it's going to be – I don't think China is going to be doing fantastic the rest of this decade. I think what we have to look for is just some recoveries, some support. Uh, can we get better trade relations and calm things around the world, stuff like that. But I can't be in line with some of these macroeconomists. They're, they're saying we should pay no attention to this Fed cut, that the real news is keep an eye on China. They're concerned something's going to go wrong and it's going to cause a contagion problem in coming years. Now, I've also learned they're not very good at timing these things. And I don't think they know whether the issue is going to drop today or is it next year or the following year. And my work, my best work is saying it's probably years away yet if China's going to fall apart. And as long as it waits to 2020, 2028 to 2031, I'm not going to worry because really the whole world's probably going to fall apart then. <laughs> so <laughs> just, just give yeah. me my next two to three years here to yeah. make some money. Yeah. And uh, so, you know, maybe I'm too biased myself of being too optimistic of the U.S. and the, and the world, but I, I don't think so. I, I think we're going to do very well. I think next year is going to be a great year in the stock market and probably add some more in 2026. Then we might, then I will reevaluate. I mean, I have to have corrections from time to time. No sure. About it. And uh, but right for the moment, I'm doing my best to try to come up with the twist and turns during a week, during a month, during a year to warn my subscribers, okay, if this is meaningful to you, hopefully I can help you time it so you can do something about it. But my general attitude is I'm really more interested in what's going to happen in the next two or three years. And for me, that's to be optimistic to the U.S. economy. We are doing the best of the world and considerably better than a lot of the world, I'm much better than what people thought two or three years ago. Right. Uh, are we overdoing it? Not yet. Not yet. And to me, the Federal Reserve, by lowering this half a point, just provided me a little bit of a better floor and less risk. And my model is feeling happy dappy this morning, and so am I. <laughs> right. But like I say, I, you know, even I'm looking for a potential setback, at least sometime in October, maybe. That's normal behavior. That's standard operating procedure. And I may not do anything about it personally, but I'm going to help my subscribers that if they want to do something, hopefully I can help them saying, sell this thing right now, but get ready to buy it again, you know? Right. And uh, I, I think ultimately we'll see the stock market in the U.S. be up in November. We're still going to get good economic indicators. I think the Federal Reserve, I would have been really, if they hadn't lowered interest rates this week, I would have been betting on the downside, seriously, because it's getting to that breaking point. Right. They needed to move soon. 
but it's it's not such that we couldn't have survived waiting another couple of months or something either, you know? Right. So I think they got it. They're, they're late, but it's just not late enough. It's and, and I've been watching the unemployment, and I'm really convinced unemployment, ideally, it can top this month. That, that would be something in a few months if we look back and say, wow, the Fed cut in September, and look at that. Uh, yeah. Unemployment backed off starting in September to October. Um, that's probably a little too soon. To, you don't see that kind of trickle effect that fast monthly. So it would yep. probably be coincidence if it happened, but that, that's okay too. But my guess is a few months from now, we will see that unemployment back off. I think we're okay. And I think this is normal fluctuation, but I think, I think the Fed woke up. Hey, we've, we've we had a war on inflation, worked very, very hard at it, harder than any other group of federal uh, Fed people since 1918 or 1913, whenever they started the Fed, you know, um, and I think they're just saying, yes, we can overdo it. And and this was the time. They, they saw the data. I think they did the correct thing. And I think it's just in time. And yes, there's still going to be lingering scares. We'll see some things even early next year, first quarter next year. I expect to see a few indicators saying, oh, the economy is slipping a little bit more. But you have to put it in context of many indicators. The economy is just not that simple. And uh, as I look at that basket, if we start losing on one side, the other side's going to do even better and more. So it offsets the economy's going to still continue to grow. So okay. two, th- two thumbs up for the Fed. Uh, I really like this half a point cut. I don't care if they do uh, drag their feet from here forward. But frankly, uh, it's not going to scare me if they, if they pound that lower by the end of this year, get it down to four. We're at um, 5% now for the Fed rate, target rate. Now, the actual Fed rate itself fluctuates around the target. It's 4.8% as of yesterday, I think. You may see dip, see that dip to 4.75, but it can also dip a little above 5. But the target rate is more fixed. You know, you, they give you the number, you just put it in your chart. That's a 5% now. And I think it's going to work down to 4 and so the question I'm getting for people now is, oh, do we get CDs of banks and lock these interest rates in? Do we buy bonds and this and that? Uh, I'm not, um, you know, I, I'm more of a stock market person. I can always make more money in the stock market than I can in interest rates. So I, I don't really want to tie up a lot of money. Uh, I want to keep it in the stock market. And to me, if the money markets are coming down from five to maybe four to down into that three year by the end of next year, I don't know, is it really worth to lock it in at banks when how can we guarantee each individual bank that they're going to stay solvent? <laughs> right. Yeah. I could see myself with luck. Uh, I, hey, I picked these five banks and two of yeah, so, them. Yeah. So, you know. Yeah. So, that's a question I got. I got two questions for you on that. So, one is. <clears throat> Looking at interest rates right now, if they do drop it another half a percent by the end of the year, and we do get into that full range, that four percent range, and you're looking at the, you know the, the average, uh, you know, bank loan at that point for uh, equipment and all these different stuff across there, will be down around that whatever you know five to five and a half range, something like that. You start looking at some of those guys that have that bought stuff in 2021, 2022 at 7.5%, 8% interest, and now they're going to go down and be like, I can refinance this at, at 5% now or 5.5%. That, that's a big deal, right? You're going to see some, some movement there, but it, that's not, that doesn't happen overnight, right? That's going to, you got operating notes and everything else that come into yeah. place. So it's like third quarter before you really see anything, a real movement in the, in the marketplace like that. The other question I have for you is the banks that got in trouble were the banks that, that were having, you know, two and a half, three percent loans and now they're they're borrowing money at at five and six percent uh, from the Fed. What's that look like in reverse now? So now you've got you're paying out five and six percent loans, now you're borrowing money back at two and a half percent. I mean, is there yeah. is there should there be a big windfall profits for the banks or, or what's that look like on the on the opposite direction? Yeah, I, I think the banks will handle the decline better than they handled the the rise. So I really don't see rising risk for banks. If, but what I'm concerned is, with my luck, if I buy a CD for six months to a year, I might pick the one bank that was already in trouble. <laughs> if I couldn't detect you got it. my luck, Rich. You got the yeah, same luck I, I, I'm just not a bank picker, okay? So right. I'm not a stock picker. I, uh, I just look at the overall stock market. I bet in the entire stock market is how I try to explain it to people. 
and that protects me. Uh, I got massive diversification that way. But um, yeah, I, uh, I, my gut feeling for myself, my money market stuff, I'm probably just going to write it down in interest rates. I just make a little less. And the yeah. reason is most of my money is in the stock market and I can handle that risk and manage that better. I understand that better. And uh, so I think I'll be all right there. But I fully understand some people, you know, they might say, gee, I don't know if 12 months from now, you know, most of my money, I'm retired, most of my money is in money market CD, stuff like that. Um, should I be locking in more here to, to try to protect it? I would say yes, um, to try to uh, save yourself something, you know. But I, at the same time, for, for how I'm investing, I guess I'm willing to write it, write it down and interest rate, make a little less just because I think the stock market on my other side is <laughs> going to make me more that I won't notice it. But yeah. some people get very intense over this. They absolutely have to make the best interest rate and make their returns in real estate and their stock market. If you're that kind of person, I, I think you have to consider rates are going down and uh, yeah. you might want to lock it in. And, uh, so when would you expect to see if they do, if there, or if we're a whole point off of where we started at at the beginning of the year, for a whole point off of that, going into 25, when would you expect to see a big rebound in, you know, like take, take like, like John Deere, you know, Case, you know, C&H, those kind of companies like that, their stock price where now all of a sudden it doesn't really matter what the price of corn is right now. If you're going to, if you can take your 7.5% loan, refinance that into a 5% loan, I mean, all of a sudden, the price of corn doesn't really matter anymore when yeah. you're looking at farm equipment because every banker on the planet is going to be like, you want me to um, you know, extend your uh, line of credit or whatever, go refinance your, your equipment debt, whether that's purchasing new equipment or used equipment or whatever else, but just get that 7.5% interest off of, of your books and put it down at 5%. Yeah. You, when, when would you expect to see something like that? I mean, would you expect to see something like that happen because of this? I, I, I think so. I mean, I don't know their, their actual cost because uh, normally it costs you money to refinance and then flip over. So how much of a savings will you get? But I suspect late next year, I think you're on the right track, yeah. like third quarter. Yeah. Uh, That's kind of what I was thinking, you know, when you look at that. Well, because cause most guys, I mean, if you look at it, operating lines of credit for most companies, you don't see that in any sector for the most part, really till late first quarter, early second quarter. And they're kind of operating into, um, you know, through the rest of the year, getting through that December time frame, And then they're taking a look at what they need to have going into the upcoming year. So it looks like to me at a minimum, you're talking early, early summer before you saw really any movement in, and any kind of a economic boom that would come from this. I mean, is that a fair statement? You think? Yes. Yeah. I think you're on track. Yeah. Right on. Okay. And something to think about is probably in 2026, 2027, you'll actually see interest rates tick up some. And I think we'll probably see inflation tick up some, but let's not worry about that right now. <laughs> we, right. We, need, we need to enjoy this setback of, uh, of interest rates and inflation right now. So as you're looking at it right now, Rich, if you step back and say, you know, you're Rich Possum, you're, you're chairman of the of the Federal Reserve, and you're and you're looking at interest rates as a whole. If you could say, hey, you know what, we want to be at you know four percent, five percent, whatever that is. What number do you think is the right number? I, it, obviously, it's not zero percent, right? No. But I mean, is it four percent? Is it five percent? Like where where in your history of the stuff that you followed? You know, it feels like, you know, historically, the average in, uh, Fed interest rate has been between 4 and 6%. So, I guess as you're looking at that, do you feel like that 4, 5, 6% range is, is the right number? Or, or where do you feel like that should uh, fall? I would say, yeah, if I'm running the Fed and I was thinking, how much do I really need to drop this to ensure the economy doesn't have a problem, but at the same time doesn't kick up inflation? Uh, I see it. I, I, I can see it going to 4%. Going into the end of the year, like what people are talking about now, again, that's not the Fed was just saying they may do that. Right. Um, I think into next year, though, I would I would want it at four percent to even as low as three and three quarters, three and a half. But if I can get it down below four percent going to next year, frankly, if the economy is still humming along nicely, 
I think I'd stop there because I think they start dropping it down to 3%. It's going to come back to bite them in 2026, 2027. You're going to see the economy running too hot again, too hot inflation. And then people are going to start saying, oh, we made a, they made a mistake like they did in the 1970s, where we got about the mid, late 70s, and suddenly, you know, they brought inflation down, they were happy, and next thing it just exploded out. Yeah. That could be a setup. So to me... I mean, Powell made an interesting comment because I, it was funny. I made I wrote on this somewhere, or so somebody even I can't remember, and I just said, you know, I, I don't think I'd lower interest rates back to two percent this this decade. And Powell, like two days later, comes out and said, well, we really need to bring bring it back to two percent in a sense that really helps so many businesses and really helps the economy so well, you know, and investors and this and that. But. Um, so that kind of surprised me that he was kind of leaning. Someday we'll, we're going to do that. We're going to get it back there. Um, I don't agree with that, and that's not what they're dialing in right now. That may be what they're talking with privately, but um, I, I don't see. To me, I want to see an elevated rent interest rates for the rest of this decade compared to the prior decade. I don't want to go back to those super low interest rates. I think that's right. going to cause some problems. And maybe some of the problem around 2030 when I expect another economic recession in the stock market. So, um, yeah, I, I, from now in the next 12 months, if I'm running the Fed, I'm not dropping about three and a half unless you can prove to me the economy is, is not holding up the way I expect it. Right. So another thing, too, you've, and you've mentioned this on here before, but, you know, if you if you do do that, you keep it in that 4% range or whatever else, and you do run into an economic downturn, true economic downturn that's just because of a, of a cyclical business cycle and not because of a, a pandemic. But as you run through that, it kind of gives you some space to, to drop it down to 2% if you need to, and then go and kind of work your way back up through that downturn, right? Yeah, dead on. Yep. 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 Okay. All right, Rich. Solve the world's problems today, buddy. I appreciate you coming on. <laughs> <Dude>. <laughs> All right. Rich, talk about your podcast where people can find it. Yeah, go to criticalpointpod.com. You can also go to criticalpoint.podbean.com. Uh, the bean.com site is really just a list of videos and audios, but you can click on those and find ways to sign up. Some of them are free, some of them are locked up. The other site is more about myself, just explaining stuff, but there are tabs to click on. To, to go sign up, it's 28 bucks a month. Uh, I don't present any kind of newsletter because, frankly, my service is worth, uh, you know, 200 a month. But, but the point is, I don't give out all this written stuff. I don't have to spend all that time. I get right to the point. I show a video. You can see me draw it out on a chart. Hey, here's where we sold. Here's where we bought. Here's where the bad news was supposed to occur, and it did, you know, stuff like that. And becomes very, very valuable for them. So I do more videos than audios, but sometimes, especially if it's just a quick comment, I'll do just uh, just an audio. And I usually update every morning, which for some people is a little too redundant. They don't need it. But normally around Thursday, I do a weekly update on the stock market, the economy, gold, bonds, oil. I do a separate weekly update in corn, wheat, soybeans. Uh, and occasionally some kind of monthly update. And then, yeah, I don't, some people wait around for their updates to give some kind of alert. Not me. If I suddenly at 1208 today get a sell signal on my model and it's something my subscribers are paying me for, I'm going to be on the phone that quick saying, Hey, <laughs> we got a signal. All right. And, uh, so I throw in alerts, throw in the daily updates, and then I have this weekly, uh, update. Yeah. Well worth your time to check it out. Rich's stuff's good. There's uh, he has a uh, an Apple uh, podcast feed that comes through on, on the, the stuff that's free. And the nice thing about you, what you're doing, Rich, is it's not an hour long podcast. It's eight to you know five to eight minutes long, and it's it's just a quick hitter. And like you said, you don't you don't put out a newsletter, but nobody reads it anymore either, Rich. So you're you're doing yourself <laughs> a favor, right? So yep. all right, buddy. Well, Rich, appreciate you being on the podcast, man. We'll catch you again next time. Thank you. All right, bud. When you partner with Axon, you immediately gain access to a full range of products and solutions designed to meet the complex needs of today's grower. We carry all major brands and sizes of tires and wheels. We specialize in large diameter wheels for large equipment. We have one of the largest OEM replacement wheel inventories in North America. 
Known for extreme flotation setups, duels, and triples, we have wheels for all makes and models of tractors, sprayers, combines, and grain carts. If we don't have the wheel in stock, we'll custom build, sandblast, and paint in-house. There isn't a more vast inventory in North America dedicated to helping dealers move more iron. With facilities on the West Coast and in the heart of the Midwest, leverage our 230,000 square feet of indoor inventory to solve any problem a grower may have. Move more iron with Axon. Moving iron. Valley Transportation has been hauling ag and construction equipment across the country for the past 33 years. Call Parker at 800-657-4910 for all your trucking needs. At Valley Transportation, our goal is to help you reach yours. To the machine shed here, got air channel back on. We found some uh, some unsuspecting victims there at, at uh, Husker Harvest Days to come talk about the product they got, Aaron. How you doing, bud? Good, good, good. Good, man, good. Well, I'm excited about this. We, You know, Aaron Fennel and I went to uh, Husker Harvest Days, and we were walking around, and we were walking through the uh, uh, the show and in, you know, typical Aaron Fennel fashion. I saw that on blah, 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 and he ran over there and was jumping all over it and couldn't wait to see it in real life. And ran into uh, Trevor and uh, over there, Trevor Hood and John Magnus at Ag Multi Trailer. And, you know, long story short is I, I thought it was probably one of the most innovative things I saw at the show. But there's a lot of really innovative things there, but something that's simple that you're going to get a lot of use out of pretty innovative wise. They, they put together a trailer that's not only a bell mover, but it's also a, a regular trailer. And you can either get the 50 foot, 53 foot version for your semi, or you can get the 35 foot gooseneck for your, for your truck. And I saw that and I was like, man, this is pretty impressive. This is what's one of those things. And of course, Aaron, you know, Aaron, Aaron being Aaron, he's like, Oh, this thing's be, wish I had one of these for the sheep farm, you know, but, 10 years from now, I'll be able to afford one and, you know, yeah. that kind of thing. So, well, and, and that's what it was. I saw it on Facebook uh, this summer. Well, hey, mm-hmm. and nothing that I do happens within 10 miles of home. So right. the machinery is hauled, the machinery is hauled, and then you haul the hay home. Well, if only somebody made one trailer to just do it all. <laughs> that's right. Well, we got two guys that have done that. So, you know, Trevor and John, appreciate you guys being on. Go ahead and introduce yourselves and talk a little bit about your company. Okay. I'm John. <laughs> um, nice to meet you guys. Well, thank you. I'll kind of give you the, the history of this. Um, okay. We have a patent on this trailer, but we I didn't have the original patent. Um, I was hauling hay. I had like most farmers, I had a flatbed trailer and I had a single row hay trailer and did most of our hauling or that's what we used in most hay operations. It's hardly ever the guy bailing hay doing the hauling. It's always grandma and grandpa or the wife or the kids. And in my case, it was my two daughters that did most of our hauling. And, um, I had to buy some alfalfa. We can't grow it where we live. So we bought some and I bought 36 bales about an hour and a half from home. And it took me a day and a half to get it hauled. And so the whole time I was hauling that hay, I kept thinking, man, I'd like to have a double row hay trail. It would make things so simple or so much easier and faster. But the problem is, is with us, like most people, we have about 35 mama cows and we haul two or 300 bales a year. And that's that's really not enough to justify a specialized trailer that sits there all year and only hauls two rows ahead. So I looked on the internet and on YouTube and I found the multi-trailer. And at that time it was called the Herring multi-trailer. It was made in Canada. And so um, anyway, I did some research and went and looked at one. There was one in Oklahoma. Um, One of their dealers in Wichita, Kansas told me about it. And so um, I went and looked at it and I wasn't very impressed. It was spring loaded. It was hard to lift. And I knew my wife and daughters couldn't, couldn't handle it. And so I kind of wrote it off and I had a friend with me and several months later, he called me and said, Hey, there's one of those trailers for sale on the internet in Ohio, but it's hydraulic. And so I called the guy that night and bought it over the phone and it was made by, um, a company called egg shield out of Canada. And, okay. um, I called them, um, 
you know, about the trailer initially. And, and it was just way too expensive for me to justify, you know, like when you guys looked at it, except it was a lot cheaper back then before COVID and all those things. And anyway, right. I kind of wrote it off, but I bought that used one. And when I was talking to the dealer in Wichita, Kansas, he had mentioned that the guy that owned the patent on that trailer was from up near Salon and his last name was Herring. And so after I bought the trailer, I teach engineering in high school. And so I was curious about why they did some of the things that they did. And so I started calling people just randomly and finally, you know, with that last name and finally found the guy and we visited a little bit and had a few phone, had a few conversations over the phone about why things were the way they were and those kind of things. And, and, um, a few weeks later, he called me and he said, Hey, John, those guys in Canada haven't paid me any royalties in about four or five years. And if you wanted to buy the United States patent, I would sell it to you. And so, you know, I told him that we'd pray about it and, and we did. And I thought, you know, I've lost more money by having bulls struck by lightning than this deal because there wasn't a lot of that patent left. <laughs> And so um, I decided to take a chance. And so we did. And I thought what I would do is I would just call different places and get bids on building the trailer for me. And nobody would even talk to me. I mean, they were rude and they just hang up on. Me. And so anyway, one thing led to another. And we found a company that would make those trailers for us. And um, the original patent we signed it in about 19, we started producing those trailers um, a similar trailer to those, but it was very different. In January of 2020, we sold our first trailer. And um, that trailer kind of progressed and just kept making changes and finding better ways. But what the farmers told me in the beginning was they said, John, you got to do something to get rid of those ramps. They're way too heavy to pull out ramps in the back. We just can't deal with them. And um, even though you can haul stuff, we we almost feel like keeping our old trailers because we need, we don't want to deal with those ramps. So I started right away on designing a ramp and we came out with our hydraulic flip over ramp on the dovetail in 21. And we filed for our um, preliminary patent in I think June of 21. And um, it was finally issued in 23. So we've had a patent on that in the way a few other parts of that trailer run. The initial patent expired about the time our patent took over. And so that's kind of how I got started and um, was in this deal. And I teach school full time. And, you know, people asked me in the beginning if they said, I bet you want this to take take off so you can quit teaching school. And I said, absolutely not. If I have to do anything, I'm going to hire somebody to do what I can't do because teaching school is my passion and it's my ministry and it's my lifelong calling. And so that's where Trevor come in. Trevor um, is a highly certified welder and a fabricator. He's got a really good engineering type mind. And so as we were making some changes to the trailer over time, um, I recognized his talent and his skill. And I've known his family for a long time. Um, we went to church together. I coached him in uh, ninth grade football. And so we had a, a history and I knew his character. And so that's why um, here a year or so ago, I asked Trevor if he wanted to go partners in this deal and see what kind of good we could do with it. And so, that's what we did. We, we have a partnership in uh, our fabrication business. It's called J3T Fabrication. And we're in the process now of switching over from Magnus Equipment LLC to J3T Equipment. And what that stands for is I'm John. My wife is Julie. His wife is Julia. And, of course, Trevor. So we got three J's and a T. And my Hello. wife is an, as a retired accountant, and his wife is a highly acclaimed marketing um, executive, if you will, at a, at a local firm and does a great job on some big accounts. And so the four of us putting our knowledge and skills together, we think, is going to make this thing go way bigger than it would have ever been with me just trying to run it while I'm teaching school. Let me introduce you to the Ag Multi Trailer. It is a three-row hay trailer that is also an extremely heavy built flat deck designed specifically for ag use. 
It has a tall gooseneck that will not crush the sides of your truck bed when crossing rough terrain. It has a heavy-duty 19-pound I-beam frame, semi-truck suspension, up to 12,000-pound axles, 18-ply tires, and it also has 40,800 pounds of spring under each axle. It's completely hydraulic and even has a hydraulic dovetail ring. I think that covered the basis there, man, on, on uh, what, you got, what you got going on there. All right, Fennel, what's okay. your questions, man? <laughs> Let it rip, buddy. So I, I noticed on that trailer, this it was this spring, this summer, something like that, when I saw that video on Facebook and started following the Facebook page and really paying attention to that trailer. The, uh, everything on that trailer, I noticed that Husker Harvest Days is hydraulic. Is that right? Is that an upgrade or is that just how it comes? It's all electric over hydraulic and that's the trailer. Many parts of that trailer that work have always been hydraulic since I took over. And what Mr. Herring told me was he designed it to be hydraulic, but when he made the deal with Ag Shield in Canada, um, they wanted to cut out the cost of the hydraulics. And so they went to a spring-loaded setup, and he went up there, and, I mean, his own words, what he told me was he didn't think they ever got it right. He spent as much time as he could. When he left, he didn't feel confident in it. So his advice to me was keep it hydraulic. Now, there were a few options, like we put a hydraulic motor on the jacks. Instead of doing a true hydraulic jack, we put a motor on there so that if your battery's dead or whatever, you can take a pin out of one side and put it in the other, you can still use your hand crank. That used to be an option, but if what we found was almost everybody wanted it, and the guys that didn't would call me a week later and want me to ship it to them, you know, ship them to set up, and then they had sure. to call it. So we just added in the price of the trailer, and, um, you know, put that option on there. So everything for the most part is hydraulic and what wasn't initially we put on there was, you know, we thought in the beginning, you know, I've always been conscious when we started, when I called Ag Shield in Canada, their price on the trailer was 23,000 in, in, in Canada. And we started producing them in 2020 and the price was 16,000. Because I've worked hard the whole time to keep the price of that trailer as low as we could. You know, one sure. thing is we don't have dealers. You know, I knew that going in. I told my wife, I said, you know, we're gonna have to we're gonna have to sell these trailers because if we have to add a dealer commission and they're gonna cost so much nobody's gonna want. It. And I felt guilty asking sixteen thousand for them. And the other part was I had a guy from Dallas, Texas call me and want to buy it in the Texas, Oklahoma region to sell those trailers and market them. But he said, if we make this deal, you're going to have to go up in the price so I can make my commission. And I said, well, I don't think that'll work. And he said, you're mistaken. He said, those trailers are way too cheap. And I didn't believe it. And I turned him down on the deal just because I wanted to keep the price down. And now right. the price of the trailers, they're almost 32000 for a base trailer. I mean, part of that was COVID and inflation. Part of it was just improvements we kept making that we felt were worth it you know, like the dovetail trailer, you know, that increased the price 3000 just right off the bat right there. And then when we went up, right. we went to a different axle and suspension setup, you know, it has the, the semi suspension, the hutch suspension, like you see on a, on a semi truck, each axle has 40,800 pounds of spring under it. Because for me, designing a trailer to pull three rows of round bales over a terrace in a field, that's a different challenge than trying to design a trailer to be as light as possible to go down the interstate, you know, for like right. a hotshot driver. It's a different, it's a different thing altogether. Right. And so right. I hope that answers your question. Oh yeah, yeah absolutely. 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 And, and I know, you know, just little things about it that I like so much that it is all, all hydraulic, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't get much simpler and easier to use than that. And, when it, when it's all the way unfolded, it's truly there's no ridge anywhere. Like it is level flat all the way across the top. I expected, you know, at a hinge there to be a couple inches or something like that. But it's I was really impressed impressed how flat it folds because in in our world out here the bales are going to get hauled endwise out and either you know two and four or two and one. 
on. So I was looking at it. I my eyes look at it from that standpoint versus you know the tubular hauling, and even even from the you know flat side out hauling, I guess I'd call it hauling it that way. It's blew me away just from that standpoint. I didn't even realize you guys built it to be the linear hauling. So as far as when it's folded flat, there's still like there's two two inch tubes running down the middle of the trailer and they're three sixteenths wall, two inch square tube um, on the inside of the centers that raise up. And the purpose of that is when you're hauling hay, if you've got older hay with a flat spot in it or something that doesn't want to roll off the trailer, you can push it. And so that's the only high point. And uh, oh, okay. I mean, we've hauled quite a bit of stuff on them. And I've never had it be an issue as far as it not being perfectly flat. It's a one inch raise and then it drops right back down. And then as far as like the hydraulics being, I always say it's about 95% hydraulic, um, but all the heavy lifting is done. And so right. you might have a pin or a, a slide latch or something to move around, but anything that requires any real effort is hydraulic. So it makes it a little friendly for everyone to use. What? What do you need out of, like on the semi model, any truck can do it, right? You don't have to have a wet kit or anything like that, correct? It's a standalone. We're looking at an option for an add-on wet kit, but it'll still have a standalone unit. And so the wet kit will be optional, an optional add-on, but even when it's on there, it'll still be an option. So you can still have gone to with a truck that doesn't have a wet kit and still right. operate. Okay. Okay. How'd you come up with that color? That's a very <laughs> vibrant blue. Yeah, that's not like that's like that's not, that's not a normal blue color. I, I was my, happy about one of my questions. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, I asked Mister Herring when I signed that original contract if we could change the color because blue's not my favorite color. Right. But he said he started with blue. I thought it was being a Kansas person, you know, Kansas blue or something. He said, no, that had nothing to do with it. He just tried to pick a color that was the, the least popular color in trailers so that it would stick out. And then, uh, and, I, and I so wondered if I had those ones in there. Yeah. yeah, he built a few trailers like that. And then uh, the guys in Canada continued that. And I wanted to make it maroon because that's my favorite color. But um, he, he told me, he said, uh, you know, I don't really care, but I think it's a mistake. If you change it, do what you like. And um, when I brought that first trailer home, I told several of my friends about it, and they just had a hard time wrapping their mind around what it was and how it worked. And so a few of them come over to the house, and, you know, a few days later, one of them called me, and I was at school, and he said, hey, can I borrow your trailer today? I need to go get a tractor or whatever. And I said, sure. Well, we live in a real small town. But before he could make it through town, two of those other guys saw him go through town and they called me and said, somebody just stole your trailer. <laughs> and so I knew right away that people aren't used to seeing blue trailers. And it, now it's like John Deere Green. It's like a staple. And then when I right. signed the contract, Pisano Trailer started to make them for us. And they said, now one thing to keep the cost down, we can't change colors. Up. We're going to have to buy this paint in large quantities to keep the cost. And I said, okay, that's fine. And now people ask me every once in a while, can we get it in black or can we get it in whatever? And I said, well, call John Deere and see if they'll make you black, you know, or a blue one or whatever, you know, so you get it's kind of become a joke, but now, yeah. you know, the funny part is people never remember the trail. You know, they, they couldn't remember hearing multi-trailer. And we had uh, at some point in the middle, we had a marketing firm kind of courting us and asking us, you know, to hire them to do our marketing for them. And, um, one of the things when they gave us their briefing, they told us right off the bat, we need to change, change the name because they ran it through some kind of computer. And they said, that is absolutely one of the hardest names to remember. You got to come up with something better. And so, um, when that, when that, when Herring's patent ran out and we changed it up, um, it was no longer his deal. So I changed it to the ag multi trail. And I probably shouldn't have done that. I should have found a better thing or had a contest to have somebody come up with something other than ag. But it was simple and common because it's an agriculture mod, uh, trailer. And so that's kind of how that deal went through. But the funny thing is, is even today, 
People call me, I get calls every day and I return them when I get out of school typically. But they'll say, are you the guy with the blue hay trailers? They don't remember ag, they didn't remember herring, but they do remember blue. So that's one reason we stuck with the blue. There you go. I myself, I couldn't remember the name for the life of me. I tried looking on Facebook and I even typed in blue hay trailer. There you go. You guys, you guys go buy those. Start buy those. Uh, start start tagging that there. Blue hay trailer. There you in go. Your, in your uh, in your stuff there. So yeah. When you guys started doing this, you know, you know, John, taking a look back at where you went through. What were some of the biggest struggles you went through uh, bringing this the product to market the way you wanted to bring it to market and making the changes you went through? What were some of the biggest hurdles you had to overcome? Well. You know, there's been a few, few more prominent than others. But I will tell you that this has been a God thing from the beginning. And I still ask myself someday why, you know, I have people ask me, you know, why I did this. You know, it's not like I needed something else to do with teaching school full time. And, you know, I coached a robotics team and and we farm and bale hay and I, I had plenty to do. But God just put it on my heart and gave me peace in this deal. And he's kind of just laid this thing out from the beginning. Um, you know, one of the things that we had, another company has a patent on a hydraulic dovetail. And they tried to put some pressure on us to get rid of our dovetail. And, um, you know, that was probably one of the things I lost the most sleep over. Um, and that's when Trevor came along. Um, but... We worked hard, and I have a very, very good um, accounting firm, or I mean, an attorney firm out of Oklahoma City. They do all the attorney work for, like, Ditch Witch and Toro Mowers and some really yeah. big people in the game. And so this other company is one of the biggest ones, and they came at us, and those guys, you know, it took us about four months to convince them that our patent didn't infringe on their patent, and they kind of you know, backed off. But when it first started, I thought, Oh, you know, God, what is going on here? I feel like, you know, this is going to be something that's going to be substantial. And, and we came through it. But as far as the marketing, you know, I feel bad that it takes us so long. We've always had a waiting list. We've never had a trailer show up to this day. Um, that wasn't sold before it got here. There's always been a waiting list. And so the marketing has kind of grown through Facebook and some other stuff and word of mouth. We have, you know, a lot of customers who've had, they're on their fourth trailer now. Every time we come up with a, with another trailer, they want the newest and latest and greatest. And like that semi trailer that we had at Husker Harvest Days, that guy's had three goosenecks. And so when he called and said, okay, put me on the list for a semi, I said, do you want me to help you sell your gooseneck? And he said, no, I'm going to need them both. And so the marketing, the parts that you think would struggle most businesses, that part's been laid out. But just some of the design stuff, and we've tried some things that, you know, work sometimes and sometimes they don't. We have to back up and and kind of go at it. Trevor has spent a lot of late nights, you know, thinking and working and, you know, in the shop trying things. Um, Late night phone calls talking about things that ways we could make that work even better or fix what didn't work, you know, find another solution to it. Yeah. So, so the semi, sorry, Casey. No, go ahead. Go ahead. ahead. The semi trailer is, is that new this year? Then the gooseneck was actually the start of it. Do what? The gooseneck was first and the semi trailer is, is, is that new this year then? Yeah. It is. Okay. Well, we've got so we've got the thirty-two foot gooseneck, which is by far the most popular. Um, and we've sold two, I think, twenty-seven footers. Um, we've got some forties and forty-twos out there that are all gooseneck. And then obviously we've got the step deck, which is a fifty-three and a half or fifty-four and a half or a fifty-three. Um, and then we're working now on doing a miniature kind of a miniature step deck, which will be for like a two ton truck or a bobtail semi. And it'll be a 40, basically come out to about a 42 footer. So it'd be like a 32 foot gooseneck, but it'll have a step on the front of it. So you can use the front section. 
and it'd be a little much for a pickup, but for guys that don't have a real big semi or they can, you can buy those little bobtail semis super cheap. Oh, yeah. And yeah. so it's a kind of, we think it'll be a pretty big hit for a lot of people. Yeah. It's really good. Yeah, well, I know you guys right. got one of those bobtail semis. Yeah. Um, you know, what I found is I tell everybody all the time that, um, you typically run out of truck before you run out of trailer. These oh, trailers are oh, way oh. All built and they're, they're heavy. Um, you know, the way the frame is designed is way different than a normal trailer. Typically I've never seen another trailer and I've owned several and I, every time I see another trailer, I look under it to see, but the way our frame is designed is different than anyone I've seen. I'm not saying there's not one like it, but our trailers don't twist up typically. Um, so what happens is guys will buy them and plan on, you know, pulling them with their one ton or three quarter ton or whatever. And they realize how much hay they can haul pretty soon. Their truck isn't enough. And they end up within a year having a bobtail. Right. But what we found is a lot of those bobtails are old coat trucks. You know, the older ones will have like a five, nine Cummins in them or a six, seven, you know, so we really have the same motor, the same horsepower, um, you know, so they don't, when you're just getting in, and I didn't realize it in the beginning that there's a difference between one of those type single axles and then a real single axle that has a big motor. And right. so, like, those bigger ones will pull these loaded with no trouble. Um, you know, just learning from my customers explaining that to me, you know, we knew when we jumped in and bought ours just to move our trailers around. And this year when we we bailed hay, Trevor and the guys, they, they hauled it with a semi. And um, it handles a full loaded semi way, way good. It has a 14 liter Detroit in it as opposed to like a six, seven. So this right. other trailer I think is going to be a perfect fit for those guys that don't want to do that. They can pull this, this, this short step deck with those semis and have the advantage to the, of the brakes and all of the control and those things. So we think it's going to be a win-win. We'll, we'll see what everybody thinks when we get the first one going. And I've actually been thinking about that big semi trailer ever since I seen it at the show and the 40, you know, 40, 42, whatever you want to call it. I think the strong part with that is getting in and out of getting in and out of fields past your gates, yep. you know, all that kind of stuff behind a yep. regular semi, just because 53 is a bear to get in and out of a lot of driveways. <laughs> If you don't have a oh. single axle truck, you're not going to get that in anywhere tight. I'll promise you that. Exactly. 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 So I, I could see that 40, that you know, that 42 just blowing up, like you guys were yeah. saying. You know, on my operation, I used to have a bob tail because I had a gas burner one ton, went to a diesel pickup, that's fine and good, and then eventually you're back to the truck. So I, I... I think that 42, that could be a big, big deal. Yeah. I think a lot of people move that way. The investment is a lot smarter on a right. $15,000 mm-hmm. semi or an $85,000 pickup that you're going to wear in a year. <laughs> right. Yeah. 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 It's a, well, it's a win win. Win. all the modern diesel pickups, they'll, they'll pull, pull eight times what they can times. stop. So yeah. that's, that's where the big yeah. truck is not. Yeah. Yeah. So, last question I got for you guys. Uh, we're a couple of used equipment guys, and we're, we're dorks about used equipment business when it comes to values and those kind of things. You don't have dealerships, right? So, if I buy one of your trailers and I want to go sell my trailer or I want to upgrade and I want to get rid of the one I've got, what's that market look like? And 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 how how are you guys helping customers get rid of their used trailers? Talk about someone's interested if they've got a used trailer. A lot of guys will want to get rid of them. So like John was saying, they can get a newer one. Um, mm-hmm. We've got a spot on our website that will list it for them. Um, but we just basically direct customers to them. That way, I mean, we're not right. making anything on someone else's used trailer. Right. If somebody right. wants the newer one, they set their price or ask us where they think the fair market's at on it. And it just depends on what generation it is, what kind of shape it's in, what options it had. And so sure. when the price is figured up, we'll post it. Um, occasionally you'll see them on Facebook, but we don't, uh, we kind of just let them handle it. And if they want our help, we'll put it on our website and direct people there. And right. that's about as far as that goes. 
Yeah. yeah. And they, they held their value really, really well. You know, when we came out with the ramp trailer, a lot of those guys with pull-out ramps sold their trailers for more than what they paid. Um, oh, I'm sure. We, Trevor and I just, we had to go to Missouri to meet with a guy uh, about some YouTube marketing. And so we had a guy in Missouri on the waiting list for another trailer and a guy in Texas that has one of our trailers and wanted another one. So we put those two together. He saw it on our website and he bought it. And that trailer new was like, um, with all the options was right at 18,000. This guy's used it for four years and he sold it for 17. I mean, I think that's a pretty good deal. Um, so, like, yeah. That's you know, there's one, one, there. there's one on Facebook yeah. now for 25 and that's probably yeah. not very far off from what he paid brand new, you know, in the escalation yeah. of the prices and those things. So they hold their value, value really well to answer that. But, um, you know, in that there's series, right. a it's lot good. of guys, when they get in, you know, they, they want one of those used trailers, but they'll get it. And then when their new one's ready, they'll, they'll upgrade again. Or whatever. And so we've helped probably 20 or 25 people through our website sell their pull-out ramp trailers in order to get, you know, the, the hydraulic flip-over ramp trailer. And that's worked really good so far. Gotcha. And as far as some of the generational changes, like, obviously, the newest version is the best we've come up with yet. That's why it's the newest generation. Right. But, um, I mean... We just posted some on Facebook the other day of one of the Gen One trailers that's still getting after it, hauling hay like crazy. Um, the biggest thing that everyone wants to upgrade for is the ramp. The the high oh, ramp, great. like we talked about, it's gone through a couple of iterations, but it's 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 pretty bulletproof at this point. And gone through some pretty extensive changes from the very first one, and. I think that that's probably one of the most attractive things, and why a lot of people want to get rid of their older versions is most of them specifically so they can get that ramp. Yeah. You know, they say the average age of the farmer now is what 66 this year or something. And yeah. you know, guys in that, that age range either can't handle those heavy ramps. And you know, for us as a designer, that was a challenge in the beginning. Do you make a light ramp that everybody can handle, but then bends or do you make it heavy so that it's bulletproof? And then they, then they have a problem with it. And so, of course, we always lean towards over fabricating everything. <laughs> yeah. You know, we get calls all the time, you know, where people make when somebody puts a post on, you know, like one of the, the groups on Facebook, you know, they'll, somebody will make the comment or send me a message or Trevor and they'll say, well, can't you make that thing any lighter? And, you know, our answer is, well, sure, we can make it light just like everybody else does. We can cut a lot of cost out of it. But is it going to hold up? Is it going to be bulletproof when you start torturing? And then you that's got a all we It's if we're going to err, we're going to err on the side of making it overbuilt and tough. Because people are going to take that. Yeah, you know how farmers are. You know, like yep. that one. If you I go to a Facebook yeah. page, you guys might have already been there, but you saw that was one of our Gen One trailers that had three seven thousand pound axles, and I think that guy was bragging on putting thirty eight big square bales on it. <laughs> You know, or something, you know, those things are probably yeah. 800 to a thousand pounds a piece, I guess, because um, yeah. they look like alfalfa. So, you know, that trailer is just absolutely torture. Yeah. It's what they're for. Yeah. <laughs> and there, you know, it's nothing to in the, in the world that we live in today where people are you know, price conscious, but they're, you get what you pay for, right? Right. And, and uh, mm -hmm. honestly, when I was talking to you guys at, at, at uh, Husker and I was looking at that, that 53 foot trailer sitting there, and I'm thinking, like, you know, you go out and buy a, a detached trailer or something like that, or another step deck trailer with a dovetail in the back like that, you're well over 100,000 bucks, even 150,000 bucks to get something new like that. And when you told me it was half that price, I was like, man, you guys sure you want to do that? Because. <laughs> You sure about that? <laughs> yeah. And, you know, everybody wants to compare your trailer to the cheapest one they've heard of. Sure. But if you look right. at other quality goosenecks and you pair, you know, like I looked right before we got to Husker, I was looking, you know, um, I don't know if I can say this on there, but I think probably the best trailer made is a Diamond C. You know, I had one of their goosenecks before I got my first blue trailer. And I looked on there and, and their price of a 32-foot 
wood deck trailer with a hydraulic dovetail and no hydraulic jacks or anything else was more than ours. So if you're comparing quality yeah. to quality, I think you got to think that ours is a, you know, is a, you know, worth the money. And not just quality to quality, but functionality to functionality. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's, that's that's the other side of it. Is that what impressed me so much about you guys' trailer was that it wasn't just a, a you know a flat deck trailer that had you know I could strap some bells to and I could throw a. It was designed to haul bells and it was designed to haul a, my skid steer and my and my tractor too. I mean that that's exactly what it was done. So I'm not having to like throw a million straps on something and, and hope to God that I got it down right. And I, I've got it where I need, it's, it's designed to do those things. And I think that's the, to me, that's the biggest selling point. Uh, it's easily that. replacing yeah. two trailers. hundred percent. hundred percent. At least. Yeah. And so. you know, the, the sales pitch that I'll just tell you what, when people walk up to talk to me or they call me for the first time, you know, it's a trailer. You can haul your tractor to the field or your skid steer and you can unload it. And within a minute, you can be hauling three rows of round bins. Right. And at the end of the day, you go pick up your skid steer, your tractor, and you never unhook. And that's pretty good. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, this trailer brings some things to the table. You know, I tell everybody, if it were only a flatbed, I think it would be the best flatbed on the market. And this is the reason. That deck is pretty much indestructible. It's way stronger than wood. Yeah. It doesn't, it's self-cleaning. It doesn't puddle water, rain, snow, or ice. The other thing is, besides being all of those things, you can strap or chain your load down to it anywhere you want. Right. And once you once you use one of these trailers and you do that, like for instance, when I haul a big tractor um, or a skid steer, you know, whatever, I run the chains down through the deck and bring them up around the I beam and and winch them down there. And once you do that, and then you load something on a wood deck trailer, and all you have is a stake pocket on the side that only has a weld down one side of that stake pocket, you know right away when you think about it that if I get in a wreck, it's going to tear that them stake pockets off like a ribbon. And right. so that gives you a lot of peace of mind that anywhere I want, I can chain or strap something down. That's huge, and, and that's what our customers tell us is they get used to that. And, and that's huge. But then when you think about those sides, they'll go straight up or straight down. And when you get used to hauling things with those sides up, that gives you a huge peace of mind that whatever's on there, whether it's pallets or totes or skid steer, whatever it is, when I get there, it's probably, you know, if it's going somewhere, it's coming off the back. It's not going off the sides. And that gives you a lot of peace of mind. And then when you, like I said, you go to haul something on a wood deck trailer with steak pockets and you're looking like, man, there's something missing here because you don't have those sides. You just feel naked. Um, and then when you look at it as a hay trailer, it brings a lot to the market. You know, it's the only double row hay trailer that you can haul a third row on if you want. It's the only double row hay trailer on the market that you can dump one side at a time. All of the other ones that I know of, when you pull in the lot, they both got to go at once or it'll flip yeah. over. Yeah. And so ours is built so stable that you can pull in, dump one side, do a U-turn, and come back and dump the other. And when you think about time savings, that's, that's huge. Because all Big the other ones, even though you don't have to unload them, you still have to get on the tractor and move all of that hay off to the side to be able to get out the gate. Or if you don't, you know, you're going to have hay scattered over 40 acres around your barn at home that you have to restack. And so right. yep. when you think about bringing that to the market, that's a pretty neat deal. And I think the, the last part of that, our trailer, as a hay trailer, is it's the only one on the market with adjustable sides. So you adjust the cradle to the size of hay you're hauling. Um, and so all the other ones have a set size cradle. So if you haul a big bale, like a six-foot bale, it doesn't fit in the cradle. Or if you have silage bales on and you put them in there, then they're rolling around swinging you all over the place when you're driving. Right. In ours, you set that side so that it's just right so that the bales touch down the middle and you're as narrow as possible coming through gates or going down the highway. And so I think all of those things bring a lot to the table when it comes to the functionality of that trail. Uh, but that's, that's just me. You know, I wish we had some of our customers you could talk to and they could kind of tell you what they think. But, um, 
since we started, I think we've sold close to 240 trailers now in not quite five years, which is pretty amazing. You know, when I signed the first contract with Mr. Herring, he said, now the guys in Canada, they had to make 12 a year. And sometimes they struggled, but I'm just letting you know that your contract, you're going to have to make 20. And I thought to myself, well, if they couldn't sell 12, what makes me think I couldn't sell 20? You know, that's a lot. That's a big increase percentage wise. Yeah. And so I thought about it and I thought, you know, I've got plenty to do. If we can't sell 20 trailers a year, you know, I'm okay. Well, our first year we sold 54, and I think the second year we sold 68. Yeah. And so the whole thing is kind of spoke for itself. But out of all those trailers, you very rarely hear somebody that ever says anything bad or derogatory about them. Usually, you know, the posts, when somebody's asked about one on one of the hate groups on Facebook or whatever, all of my customers, they just, they just go to bat. They jump in there and start talking about, you know, what a game changer it is and how great it was and, you know, all of these things. And, and I'll be the first one to tell you, it's not perfect. You know, there's still things we're working on and things that it might not be the best at, but I think it's the best there is now. Definitely think it's the best purchase as far as that realm goes because you're filling so many needs and it's oh, yeah. great at a lot of things. And there's some things that may not be perfect at, but it's going to fill so many it's going to answer so many questions that like you all were saying earlier, you're, you're getting rid of two trailers to per, replace it with one. It's less wear and tear, less maintenance. Um, it's going to save tons and tons of time and nothing's indestructible, especially when people are loading it twice as much as it needs to be loaded. But that's why it's built the way it is. <laughs> <laughs> I think it can do pretty much everything except haul dirt. <laughs> you, or cows. you know, I don't know if you saw that post. Somebody put one here lately. You need to build a box to winch on top of it so that you can haul oh, cows. Small trailer? Yeah. Haul it for cows in there, yeah. There you go. For sure. I'll put that in our suggestion box. Dirt. <laughs> <laughs> we are working on something that, that you're going to like. It, it's coming. <laughs> I don't know. We found some. We've, we've found quite a bit of patent work here lately on some ideas that uh, Trevor's had or that we've had together. Um, that we think if we can get the patents issued on them, it'll be worth the investment to try to try to bring those to the market. And we just bought a new facility this last year. We're just moved in here in the last thirty days. Um, we have a full fabrication place and a really nice shop now. Um, to do some of this prototype work and some things that hopefully will just keep on making this brand grow. Well, that's awesome. And I'll be you know, interested to see what happens when you guys are ready to announce that. We'd love to have you back on to come on and talk about what you're doing there. So look forward to that. Right on. Well, you guys, I appreciate you being on. Trevor and John, if you guys want to reach out to you and get more information about the trailer or – Want to purchase one? What's the easiest way to do that? Uh, you go to our website, Ag Multi Trailer. It's got our phone number and our email on there. And you can call or email us, do whatever you want to do there as far as contacting us. There's a quote form on there. You can fill out and option out the trailer however you want just to kind of see prices. And uh, mm -hmm. well, I say you can print those out so you can have a couple different options, just compare them back and forth. And when you, uh, when you send in a quote like that, it'll email us. And so if you want to get reached out to, we can do that and right. answer any questions anyone's got. And that's agmultitrailer.com, right? Yep. Yeah. Okay. And our, well, our Facebook page is agmultitrailer also. Right on. And or hashtag blue hay trailer and just uh, <laughs> yeah, put that out there, right? Okay. Right on. We're, getting some, uh, we're getting some more videos and instructional stuff out on YouTube for people to look into as um, we're trying to kind of build that market up too. Awesome. Yeah, you guys will get to know if you stay, follow us here before too long, you get to meet Travis. Um, he's in Missouri. Um, he's uh, getting ready to retire out of the Army. He has a big YouTube following. And he called me and told me that uh, our YouTube channel wasn't, he didn't say it this nice, but he said it wasn't up to stuff, but he would help us if he could. So he was at Husker Harvest Days. You might have saw him walking around there. He made a really great hand, and he's uh, 
he's a believer in the trailers and very passionate about them. So he's going to bring our YouTube um, marketing up to snuff, hopefully here pretty soon. And that's going to be exciting because I think you guys will like Travis as well. That's awesome. Look forward to meeting him. Sounds good. Sounds good. Well, guys, appreciate you being on. Any final thoughts you want to throw out there about about the uh, trailers or anything else you got out there? I can't think of anything. We've talked a lot. No, I think you guys did a great job. Appreciate you being on. Aaron, folks want to reach out to you. It's the easiest way to do that. Uh, call or text 308-760-1193 or uh, pretty active on Facebook and Twitter, both by my name. Aaron Fittell. Right on. Casey Seymour, you can find me at Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Moving Iron LLC. You can link in the Moving Iron Podcast. Check out the YouTube version of this over at the YouTube channel, which is Moving Iron Podcast YouTube channel. And you can also go to movingironllc.com for everything Moving Iron related. Guys, appreciate you being on. It was great. Uh, like I said, I thought it was one of the most innovative things I saw at the uh, at Husker Harvest, just from the, the functionality of it. And I saw some pretty innovative things out there. So, guys, my hat's off to you guys, and I wish you the best of luck as you roll through the rest of 24 into 25. Thank you. Well, thanks for having us. We really appreciate it. All right, guys. Thank you, guys. The Moving Iron Podcast is brought to you by these great sponsors. Are you looking to value your equipment more accurately? Target the right buyers and close more deals? Reach your ideal customer? Then look no further. Fusible isn't just about ag data. It's about action. Our best-in-class solution empowers you to value your equipment accurately, make informed decisions, and find the perfect prospects. Ignite your dealership's growth at Fusible dot com slash moving iron dash podcast out in the field every decision counts you wouldn't plant without testing your soil so why would you prospect blind introducing eda your one-stop shop for ag equipment intel eda goes beyond specs and prices you get deep dive data on every piece of equipment like ucc filings that help track ownership changes and uncover potential sales leads D&B firmographics, which help you understand the financial health and buying power of potential customers. Market trends that help you stay ahead of the curve and insights on equipment demands and pricings. With EDA, you're not just looking at data, you're seeing opportunity. You find the right buyer, sell smarter, and build lasting relationships. Visit edadata.com for your free demo and unlock the power of knowledge. For over 80 years, Iron Solutions has been your go-to data source for ag dealers, lenders, and manufacturers. Get powerful appraisal and value forecasting tools that fuel profitable decisions anytime, anywhere. Get your free demo at ironsolutions.com. Iron Solutions, confidence in every click. Today, there are many ways to finance ag equipment, but nobody delivers simple, fast, or flexible financing like AgDirect. Learn more about your options to buy, lease, and refinance equipment at agdirect.com. Valley Transportation has been hauling ag and construction equipment across the country for the past 33 years. Call Parker at 800-657-4910 for all your trucking needs. At Valley Transportation, our goal is to help you reach yours. When you partner with Axon, you immediately gain access to a full range of products and solutions designed to meet the complex needs of today's grower. We carry all major brands and sizes of tires and wheels. We specialize in large diameter wheels for large equipment. We have one of the largest OEM replacement wheel inventories in North America. Known for extreme flotation setups, duals, and triples, we have wheels for all makes and models of tractors, sprayers, combines, and grain carts. If we don't have the wheel in stock, we'll custom build, sandblast, and paint in-house. There isn't a more vast inventory in North America dedicated to helping dealers move more iron. With facilities on the West Coast and in the heart of the Midwest, leverage our 230,000 square feet of indoor inventory to solve any problem a grower may have. Move more iron with Axon. Big Iron Auctions, customer satisfaction is our number one goal as the 40-year leader in auctions for agriculture, real estate, livestock, 
construction, and transportation, we are here to serve you. Big Iron will handle everything from start to finish. From meeting with you, to prepping your equipment, writing the listings, and collecting buyer's payments, let us do the heavy lifting for you. We love our customers, and we treat them like family. There's a Big Iron sales rep in your area, so let's get together. To learn more, visit BigIron.com. Moving iron in the 21st century. 